<clears throat> Chapter 11. In the fifteenth year of Tiberius Caesar, and under the pontificate of Annas and Caiaphas, a voice in the wilderness. I'm reading from uh, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. Since it's Corona quarantine time, I figured I might as well uh, put the time to good use because it's been quite some time since I bothered to make a video. and I figured uh, there wasn't else a lot of other folks having much going on. So please ignore the birds chirping in the background and the children screaming. <clears throat> There is something grand, even awful, in the most absolute silence which lies upon the thirty years between the birth and the first messianic manifestation of Yeshua. In a narrative like that of the Gospels, this must have been designed, and if so, affords presumptive evidence of the authenticity of what follows, and is intended to teach that what had proceeded concerned only the inner history of Yeshua and the preparation for the Christ. Uh, something I'd like to point out um, is he was just under 30. Uh, it actually says that. Um, Michael Rue did a teaching where he explained uh, that in the Greek, the term that's used there, that's where people often say that Yeshua was 30 years old when he started his ministry. Actually, he was a little before he was the age of 30. That's something I'd like to point out that's interesting. Is uh, 30 years is the orbital length of Saturn or L Saturn you prefer uh, obviously connected to the word Satan uh, is 30 years is the orbital period so when you're 30 years old Saturn is back in the sky in the same location it was when you were born so it's no surprise that as Yeshua is approaching his 30th birthday that he goes out into the wilderness and encounters Satan there and uh, you know he is tempted by the things that men are tempted by which of course is the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life because if there's one thing that men do love, it is power. And uh, whatever they hunger for and whatever they see with their eyes. And if you, uh, that's why it says, uh, I think it's James who says that that's the nature of what sin is. It's the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's where it comes from. They, they, they had carved it down to three uh, distinct and clear rules if you wanted to identify what you were doing with sin well does it come from your flesh uh, does it come from your eyes or does it come from your desire for power over other people at last that solemn silence was broken by an appearance a proclamation a right and a ministry as startling as that of elijah had been in many respects indeed the two messengers and their times bore singular likeness it was to society secure prosperous and luxurious yet in imminent danger of perishing from hitting festering disease and to a religious community which presented the appearance of a hopeless perversion and yet contained the germs of a possible regeneration. Remember when he says germs, this is old English, he means germination, he means the, the things from which something is born. That both Elijah and John the Baptist came, both suddenly appear to threaten terrible judgment, but also to open un- also to open unthought possibilities of the good. And as if to deepen still more the impression of that contrast, both appeared in a manner unexpected and even antithetic to the habits of their contemporaries. John came suddenly out of the wilderness of Judea as Elijah from the wilds of Gilead. John bore the same strange ascetic appearance as his predecessor. The message of John was the counterpart of that Elijah his baptism, that of Elijah's novel rite on Mount Carmel, and as if to make a complete parallelism with all of the memory and hope which it to which it awakened. And it's no surprise that there be a lot of parallelisms uh, between the New Testament and the Old Testament. You know, Moses goes up on the mountain for 50 days. Yeshua goes out into the wilderness for 50 days. It's just a, uh, a matter of uh, understanding that what you're seeing the history repeats itself. I guess that's the best way to say it. Time is cyclical. It's not, um, you know, it's not a straight line. 
everything continues uh, to happen over and over again throughout the year. It's like every year you'll experience life and death. And the world is born and then it dies uh, every year. The only thing that uh, continues are the uh, evergreen trees, which is why they became so popular among uh, the cults of the pagans because an evergreen tree, unlike the other types of trees, does not lose its leaves during the winter, which seems miraculous because when everything else is dropping its leaves, turning brown and apparently dying, the evergreen trees continue to persist, which of course is why if you were gonna grow an Ashira pole or an Ashira grove, uh, you'd wanna make sure it had evergreen trees in it because they do not die when the time of death comes and they, they're, uh, they're representative of continued everlasting life, uh, which is of course not what we are taught in the Bible to uh, bother with such things. All right, uh, let's see. So here he's comparing John the Baptist and Elijah. Remember, John the Baptist was, uh, he was born into the life of a Nazarite. So he didn't have a choice. His father received a vision at the temple when he was offering the sweet-smelling savor to Jehovah. And uh, the angel's like, look, your son is going to be a Nazarite for the rest of his life. That's just his, that's his duty. That's what he's going to be. He's just like Samson. He's like, he's, now, let's don't say that Samson behaved like a good Nazarite, but at least he didn't cut his hair, right? So what's a Nazarite? And a Nazarite vow is number six. In number six, you can read the details of the Nazarite vow. Um, some of the interesting things, a Nazarite cannot touch grapes. A Nazarite certainly cannot drink alcohol because that's the fermentation of grapes, so he can't have, he can't even touch a grape. The high priest isn't supposed to get drunk, but a Nazarite can't even touch a grape. So the Nazarite has a, a higher degree or higher degree of taboos than even the high priest did. So he was told right off the bat, your son will be one of these for his entire life. So you can imagine he had very long hair, probably had it curl all up and locked up into some kind of big bun or something to keep it out of his way uh, because he wasn't allowed to cut his hair. I'm sure he had a big old ridiculous beard because he also could not cut that even if he wanted to. So he would look quite disheveled when we see pictures of like a you know, a, a movie has a, a crazy, wild, homeless man, a hermit. He probably he probably resembled that, at least in the face, no matter how nice his clothes would have been. I'm sure people gave him. You understand, when you're when you're a well-known uh, prophet or uh, somebody that people come to to baptize him, his job was he, he'd be in Bethany, which is one of the entranceways. See, on the eastern side of Jerusalem, you got the area that um, is, is where the brigands are. It's dangerous, and they'd come down. they take that long road down. Uh, from the like the Galilee down and come through and they come in through Bethany so that they could be baptized or be cleansed of the dust of the outer lands that they had passed through right because they didn't want to bring the uncleanliness of the outer land into Jerusalem so John would baptize everybody when we say baptize I don't mean I baptize you in the name of the Father and Son no I mean literally he would mikvah them he would put them into the water and clean them of the dust of the lands that they had passed through because the Pharisees had declared at that time, or I guess I should say the elders of Israel had declared that if you have so much as the dust of the lands that are, uh, you know, not what would have been considered the realm of King David upon you, which you got to remember King David's realm stretched all the way to Babylon. Okay. But if you came out of a traveled out of an area that wasn't in that land, then the dust on you was considered unclean. So you needed to be washed before you could enter into the clean zone which is Jerusalem. So that's what John the Baptist was doing. He was cleansing people before they came into Jerusalem or doing what's called a mikvah in Hebrew. John came suddenly in the wilderness of Judea. John bore the same strange aesthetic appearance as his predecessor. Of course, it's because he is a, um, if, you, if, if, if you're a Nazarite, you're gonna look a little weird. And people will definitely know you are because like I said, you'll have hair that's three, four feet long. I mean, you, you may have seen pictures of like uh, some women I've seen pictures of ladies who've grown their hair out their entire life. Well, if this man's 30 years old, I've seen a 30-year-old woman with her hair growing her entire life, and it's down to her feet. So you can imagine. He had this stuff probably tied up in big knots, keep it out of his way. Maybe even dreadlocks. In fact, the uh, Rastafarian movement is a derivative of the Nazarite vow. And you'll notice that Rastafarians do not drink alcohol. Rastafarians have, do not cut their hair. That's why they have dreadlocks. or dreadlock or rasta. That's because they're... That's a Nazarite vow, you don't cut your hair. And as if to make the complete parallelism with all of the memory and hope which it awakened, even the more minute, minute details 
surrounding the life of Elijah found their counterpart in that of John. Yet history never repeats itself. It fulfills in one development that which is gives indication at its commencement. Thus the history of John the Baptist was the fulfillment of that of Elijah in the fullness of time. So he's doing, he's bringing here the idea that like Yeshua says that John is or Yochanan is Elijah if you will accept it. So it's up to you to accept him as being that representative of the spirit of Elijah. And when we say spirit at the transfiguration that's a that's a big word. Um, when Yeshua goes up on the on this, I think it was the Mount of Olives. It might have been Mount Carmel. I, I don't remember exactly. But it's Sukkot, right? Because everyone's in Jerusalem for the feast. So it's Sukkot time. So he goes up on this mountain, and the Apostle Peter sees him like trans, he sees he sees the transfiguration. He sees this bright light, right? And he sees two people appear with Yeshua on his left, or at least on one side. I don't know if it specifies left or right, but on one side is Elijah, and on the other side is Moses. Okay, Moses represents the law of God because that's what he is. He is the law of God. He is the lawgiver. That is his job. He brought people out of bondage. By giving them the law, because he said, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put a king over you to tell you what to do. Your king is Yehovah, and he will instruct you on how to live like kings instead of living like slaves." So he is. That's the law of God, the law which turns a man into a king, and releases him from the slavery to other men, and instead he becomes slave to God, because you're always slave to something, and ain't no getting away from that. You always slave to something. So <clears throat> Elijah represents. The op it, it, people are going to say like, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is God's word. God's word is the Holy Spirit. You got to remember, ruach, hakodesh, ruach is breath. It's not a, it's not a ghost. It's not a, it's not a specter or spook. It's, it's simply saying, when someone says ruach, they're simply saying breath. So what is God's breath? God's breath are the things which He has said. That's clear. I mean, when you talk, your breath comes out of your mouth. Why would you think that the Holy Spirit was not exactly what it said it was? It is the Ruach HaKodesh, the breath which sets things apart. How do you set things apart? By abiding by the restrictions and limitations which are listed in the Torah. That's how you set something apart. Because if you did the same thing as everybody else in the world, then you wouldn't be set apart. You'd be just like everybody else. So why would you think you were holy? Because to be holy means to be set apart. So with that knowledge, Elijah doesn't, he represents the spirit of prophecy. He represents the guarantee that if, if you don't do what this law has taught, then there's judgment. And also the guarantee that if you do what this law has taught, you'll come to understand things that are not in the realm of what humans normally understand. You will come into that office of, the, of a prophetic office. And when I say prophetic, I don't mean you know the future. I'm not, prophets don't know the future. I mean, it's simple to know the future is it's in Leviticus. If you walk contrary to God, then the hammer will come down and you will be punished in incremental stages. It'll be the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. That's, that's the future. I mean, you don't need somebody to say, you know, on August the 15th of 1922, uh, such and such will occur and and then God will appear and which obviously didn't happen and in 1844 the people got up on the mountain it didn't happen and now we've got the coronavirus you know making people frightened and afraid and you know the, the, the biggest the biggest and worst problem that people could ever have is to, is to just is fear when people let fear govern how they behave and who they are they lose the capacity to, to think rationally. There's a famous line in, uh, in Ghostbusters um, when the uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man appears and um, Dr. Bankman asks Egon, he says, Egon, because he's the smart one in the group, he said, what do you got? You know, what, what should we do? And Egon says, I'm scared beyond the capacity for rational thought. Because that's something that really happens. When you get terrified, your body shifts into fight or flight mode. And when you go into fight or flight mode, it's not a it's not an issue of your rational thought. 
It's original. It's a, it's an issue of I'm either going to kill what I'm facing or I'm going to run away from it. And that's it because that's that's a, that's an animal instinct that's built into your body. And it is extremely hard. I'm talking about extremely hard to train yourself to say no to your flesh when it wants something. And uh, that's what it's all about really. This is the this is the crucifixion of the flesh. That's what that's what we're doing. That's what we aim to do. I swear the shutter on this camera what is it doing? Why does it keep shuddering? Alrighty. Here we're going to continue with Alfred Edersheim uh, comparing uh, John the Baptist to Elijah. Okay, like we said during the Transfiguration, Elijah is the understanding that comes from obeying the law. Right? You have to know Moses and the law before you can understand what God's going to do if you disobey it or if you do obey it, because, of course, he wants you to obey it. For alike in the Roman world and in Palestine, the time had fully come, not indeed in the sense of any special expectancy, but of absolute need. The reign of Augustus marked not only the climax, but the crisis of Roman history. Whatever of good or of evil the ancient world contained had been fully right. As regarded politics, philosophy, and religion, and society, the outmost limits had been reached. Okay, so uh, the reign of Augustus Caesar marks the end of the republic period for the Romans. Okay, so the Romans had been a republic. They had been engaged in political, you know, in the war and in political intrigue with other nations. That's how Israel ended up a, a vassal state of Rome because two of the Hasmonean kings... Uh, well, they were brothers who were trying to get to be king, basically went to Pompeii, uh, and I believe it was actually in the city of Pompeii, uh, not the one in Italy, but one that's to the east of uh, Israel. But uh, they went to him and said, basically, you know, we want Rome to judge between us as to who should become king. And of course, Pompeii's like, no problem. I'll pick the king that is most favorable to Rome. That's easy. And he did. And it was very shortly thereafter that Augustus Caesar uh, took power. You know, Julius was killed on the Senate floor. If you've ever heard the Shakespearean play, you know, the famous line, et tu Brute, even you, or and you, Brutus, as he said to his best friend who stabbed him in the back. You know, the first man to stab him and everybody else came down from the Senate seats and murdered the emperor because they did not want an empire. They did not want an emperor. They wanted a free, well, I shouldn't say free, a republic where landed nobles controlled everything as opposed to, a you know, a king. So after that happened, there was a civil war, which was Mark Anthony uh, went down to Egypt, and Octavius, who later became known as Augustus when he ascended to the, the emperor, he renamed himself Augustus, or the glory of the sun, right? Because he's the August is when the sun is hottest, right? Julius, or July is when it's the second hottest. So, uh, you know, he, he defeated Mark Anthony. He ended the civil war. He assumed power, and he immediately changed the political structure of everything that was happening. He started minting his own coins, which is where the famous Roman coin really got its birth. And he also changed the political leaders in places. Uh, he's the one who made Herod the, the Tetrarch of Galilee. or He made Herod the uh, quote-unquote king of the Jews. Sorry, I think Herod Tetrarch of Galilee was, I think that was Herod the Great's son. So he basically established Herod the Great as the king of the place that at that time uh, was Judea and where, the, where all the Jews lived, right? So the Hasmoneans had been the rulers after the time of the uh, Maccabean Revolt. So the Maccabees revolted. Judah Maccabee leads the big fight. You know, you've heard of Hanukkah. So, and instead of doing what they really should have, because you got to remember the Maccabees were Levites, they were of the priestly line. So instead of becoming priests, they became kings. And they assumed the throne, which was meant, you know, according to prophecy, was for David and his descendants. So they assumed the throne, and the Hasmonean dynasty begins. And Herod gets appointed as the king of the Jews by Augustus Caesar. He marries um, a woman who is a Hasmonean princess. This is the woman who wanted, uh, I believe it's the woman who wanted the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. She was a Levite. She was not some Roman. She was not a Greek. She was not a foreigner. She was a Levite. Okay. So 
You know, know your history. You're doomed to repeat it. All right, whatever, whether it be of good or of evil in the ancient world, all of it had been contained and become fully ripe. So he's like, not only had we seen the best, which honestly is probably the ascension of Augustus, because he put to end the war that was that was tearing apart that whole area. Uh, Augustus requested that a regular daily sacrifice be made for his two sons at the temple in Jerusalem. He was uh, a supporter of the Jews, just like Julius Caesar had been. He was not, you know, he was not a anti-Semite by any means. He was the kind of guy who wanted peace, prosperity, and everyone to understand that he is now in control. And uh, in the Jewish mindset, in the mindset of Israel, that's supposed to be a good thing. When wars have ceased and people stop dying and stop being killed, that's a good thing. You know, it's a shame that, of course, that some parts of the people of Judea continuously revolted against the Romans um, for reasons that we shall that I, I personally would say are foolish, and it's it's all it's proved the points proven when Jehovah does not come down in a pillar of fire and smoke and defend you as he did with Pharaoh, but instead takes the curtain of protection away and allows the walls of the city to be destroyed and allows the temple to be burnt to the ground. I mean, this should be a big clue. Obviously, he's not in support of what's going on. Uh, but, you know, that's my opinion. Beyond them lay, as only alternatives, ruin or regeneration. So he's like, here we're at the point where everybody in the living in Judea, everyone who lives around Jerusalem, knows that the priesthood is appointed by the Roman governor. There's The high priest is an appointee. The high priest is essentially the king of Israel. So, because when I say king, he's the religious, he's like the pope, right? He's the religious center of the people. So, he's a Roman appointee. To get that position, it was something you had to pay for, you know, which is not uncommon in the ancient world at all. When, they, when you're the vassal of somebody else, they're in control, they make the laws, they make the rules, and when you want a political position, you pay the right person, and through corruption, you become a high political office, prince is high priest. So this is the time when the high priest was Anna and Caiaphas. They both would have paid, they both would have been well acquainted with the Roman government, and they would have been friends of the Roman government, which is exactly why when Yeshua was being crucified, what does is, uh, is the, the Caiaphas say? He says, our only king is Caesar. Caesar's the king. We accept that. We don't dispute that. We don't debate that. You know, we and and if you don't do what Caesar's law mandates in this case, to listen to the lawgivers in Israel and to put to death this man for religious reasons, which the Romans don't understand, then you are violating the contract that Caesar made with Israel, and we will demand him send a representative who can fulfill the duty of being our caregiver, our caretaker. So that's what, when Pontius Pilate was told, crucify him, whether he liked it or not, even though he didn't see a problem with what Yeshua was doing, he, you have to remember that he is not in a position where he gets to make rules. He's in a position where he executes the rules that have been given by the, by the emperor. All right. All right. So we're at the place now in the history where everything can either be rebuilt or everything's going to get destroyed, which we see when, the, you know, the temple destroyed. Jerusalem. You know, in the hunt in the you know early hundreds, destroyed the Bar Kokhba revolt, destroyed Jerusalem. They burned it, they sacked it, they salted it. They said, "Not a, another living Jew will never set foot in this city. It will never be a problem for the Roman Empire again." Of course, it's back now, but for a long time, the Romans forbade any Jew to even go in Jerusalem. All right. <clears throat> As regarded politics and philosophy religion and society the utmost limits have been reached beyond them lay as the only alternative ruin or regeneration so they had all the rules had been debated all the meanings of what the messiah was had been discussed the romans were in control and nobody was going to take that away from them. Uh, they had the jews had the choice to either rebuild themselves in the light of what god has laid out for them or to kick against the pricks and be destroyed by what God had been had laid out for. Ruin or regeneration, your choice, right? All right, it fulfills in this development that which it gave the indictment of its, uh, let's see. Ooh. It was felt that the boundaries of the empire could no longer be extended and that henceforth the highest aim must be to preserve what had been conquered. 
The destinies of Rome were in the hands of one man, who was at the same time general-in-chief of a standing army of about 340,000 men, head of the Senate, now sunk into a mere court for registering the commands of Caesar. So you got to understand where, where the senators used to create all the law. They were now enforcing the laws created by Caesar and a high priest of a religion, of which the highest expression was the apo apothesis of the state in the person of the emperor. So you have to understand, this is also the beginning of the cult of the emperor. Okay, so the Romans had not held people to be gods prior to the ascension of a Caesar. Caesar, Kaiser, King. These words all mean the same thing, right? Tsar, <clears throat> if you're Russian. Kaiser, Kaiser, Tsar. So, Caesar was not only a man, but he was ascended to, an apothesis means to arise to godhood, right? So he is an ascended being. He's not simply a man who's in charge. He's a man who is invested with the power of gods. He, he has all the power that the gods have. He has gone on earth. He's Pharaoh, essentially, from the Egyptian mindset. So the cult of the emperor begins. People start, you know, proclaiming him to be a god. And then he is. it is required that he be given sacrifices. And you'll see in the New Testament there's, you know, trouble with, during the, I think it was during the reign of Nero, that, you know, Christ, early Christians did not want to sacrifice to Caesar because they felt it was an affront to God because God specifically says, you know, in his Torah that you do not have other gods. It's, it's simple. There just are no other gods. So why, why, why even mess around with it? You know, they have no problem paying their taxes. That's, that's not an issue. The issue is not paying the taxes. The issue is not honoring the Roman government. But what it's for the issue is that a man has declared himself a god. That is forbidden. Which, by the way, is why the Jews say that they can't get on board um, with Christ. Because they say, oh, you declare that man as a god, God has forbidden this, therefore we cannot hear this argument, because you're automatically breaking the law of God. If you hear some rumble in the background, that's, that's the train. Which doesn't run nearly as much as it has in, in the past, probably because of the quarantine. Thus all power within and without and above lay in his hands. Within the city, which in one short reign was transformed from brick into marble, where side by side the most abject misery and most boundless luxury existed, of a population of about two millions, well nigh one half were slaves, and of the rest the greater part either freedmen or their descendants or foreigners. Each class contributed its share to the common decay. Slavery was not even what we know it, but a seething mass of cruelty and oppression on the one side and of cunning and corruption on the other. More than any other case, it contributed to the ruin of Roman society. Okay, you have to understand what he's talking about. So the Roman Empire, at first it was go out and get people to be Romans, right? So eventually Rome just starts enslaving everyone they conquer. So they you get conquered, you turn it, you become a slave. The Romans would bring the slaves back, they would put the slaves in charge of the lands they conquered, and they would then start gaining wealth from a slave trade. And I'm not really not really slave trade, let's trade so much as they would just gain wealth from enslaving people. So they would come out, you know, conquer a Germanic tribe, kill off all the you know, men that were willing that were gonna fight them and they didn't slave everybody else and then they'd have that those people just give send Rome produce same thing with Egypt Egypt was conquered Egypt sent I think a, a half of the Egyptian wheat harvest every year went directly to Rome um, and the Jews of Alexandria were in charge of making sure that that shipment went through so needless to say the Egyptians did not like the Jews of Alexandria because they took half of their wealth every year and sent it directly to Rome because that was the payment that Rome required. Because you got to remember that uh, uh, Cleopatra had assisted Mark Anthony in uh, in her battle or his battle against Octavius. And Octavius, also known as Augustus, did not forget. So the city had gone from brick into marble. Half of the two million people that lived in Rome were slaves. The foreigners, especially Greeks and Syrians who crowded the city, 
poisoned the springs of its life by the corruption which they brought. The free citizens were idle, dispiated, sunken, their chief thoughts of the theater of the arena, and their most supported and most are supported public cause. And you have to understand these large Roman corporations formed up. All ran on slave labor. So it became that there was just no no person who was born a freed person could get a job. There was no jobs for them because every job was occupied by slaves who were owned by someone else. So there was no point trying to go and get employed because if you weren't born in a wealth of nobility, you couldn't find a job anyways. So eventually you have what's called Pan Am and you may recognize that term from the Hunger Games because the whole place in the Hunger Games, the, 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 the country is called Pan Am. It's bread and circuses. So the Romans essentially just would give food away for free because they grew so much of it. And they'd give, uh, you know, let people go to the games, usually for free, because you can't get a job anyways. You might as well live off the state. That's what it boils down to. And then we're all waiting on our, this is going to date this video if anybody watched later. And we're all waiting on our check from, from, from the government for this quarantine. We'll see how that pans out. <clears throat> but it's nothing new because we're reading about that happening right now even in ancient Rome even at the time of Christ the uh, welfare state was alive and well the freedmen who had very often acquired their liberty by the most disreputable of courses had prospered in them combined in the shameless manner the vices of the free with the vileness of the slave the foreigners brought terrible corruption with them the free citizens were idle dispiated and sunken their chief thoughts of the theater and of the arena and they were mostly supported at public cost while even in the time of augustus more than two hundred thousand persons were thus maintained by the state see two hundred thousand people were paid for by the roman state to just it's a welfare state i mean they were getting they're getting their welfare check because you can't get a job every job's occupied by a slave you know the government might as well just pay you for being a citizen which is what they do what of the old Roman stock remained was rapidly decaying, partly from corruption, but chiefly from the increasing cessation of marriage and the nameless abomination of what remained of family life. So you see, the collapse of the, the family, it's, it's not new. It's not an American phenomenon. It's happening because of prosperity in America, but it was happening because of prosperity in Rome too. When people aren't struggling against something, it means they tend to become disinterested in the things that give strength and stability in life. So if your government is your God, there's no point in bothering with some invisible God. You know who your God is. Your God's the government. You don't have to worry about an invisible God because the government will tell you what to do. As long as you do what the government says, you'll be fine. Even in the places where it is terribly corrupt and everyone knows it, you just keep playing the game. And that, of course, that's a game of corruption, right? You, you, you learn how, to, how the system works, not how it should work. You learn how it does work. And uh, as you see here, uh, men were just going their own way. It just there wasn't no point in getting married. There wasn't no point in having children. I mean, shoot, even if they, even if you had them, it ain't like they can go find a. It, what what prosperous uh, career would they have? There's no land to get because all the lands owned by slave owners who have half the population are slaves working to other people's lands. You know, the only thing you could do is join the Roman military, and then all you would end up doing is going out farther conquering land and enslaving those people and then you could be one of these landed noblemen the state of the providence provinces was in every aspect more favorable but it was the settled policy of the empire which only too surely succeeded to destroy all separate nationalities or rather to absorb and to grecianize all so that's to say the the romans had inherited the greek culture and now they were going to forcibly inherit everyone to that culture the only real resistance came from the jews their tenacity was religion, and even in its extreme intolerance of exclusiveness, served a most important providential purpose. And so Rome became to all the center attraction, but also of the fast-spreading destruction and corruption. Yet this unity also, and in the common bond of the Greek language, served another important provincial pur purpose. So did, in another direction, the conscious despair of any possible internal reformation so it's saying that in a good in a good thing they unified the empire they had one common language which is the greek language and the bad thing was when you unify and solidify you crystallize and when you crystallize you cannot change 
This indeed seemed the last word of all institutions in the Roman world. It's not in me. Religion, philosophy, and society had passed through their every stage to that despair. Without tracing the various phases of ancient thought, it may be generally said that, in Rome at least, the issue lay between Stoicism and Epicureanism. The one flattered its pride, the other gratified its sensuality. The one was in accordance with the original nature of the character, the other was in the later decay and corruption. Both ultimately led to atheism and despair, the one by turning all higher aspirations selfward, and the other by quenching them in the enjoyment of the moment. So he's saying that, and you'll, you'll see in the New Testament, Paul mentions running into some Stoics, and he has a debate with some Stoics. The Stoic religion is one of, I guess I'd say like internal strength and fortitude, which is, I shouldn't say it's religion, it's a philosophical concept, which is where you say, I will deny myself, and by denying myself, um, I will ascend. So uh, I become an aesthetic. I become a person who chooses not to indulge in earthly pleasures because I am better than you. Uh, I, am, I am a higher being, so I do not delve into the things that you lower people delve into. And this is, I'm talking about stoicism. I'm not saying this to myself. So Epicureanism is quite the opposite. It says, well, hey, life's good. You should live it because there's a reason. The gods must be wanting you to have all this because you're living at a time when it is. So enjoy it. Eat and drink for tomorrow. We, we will die, right? You got to take advantage of what you got when you got a chance to take it. Otherwise, it'll be gone and you never got to taste it. All right. Both ultimately by quenching them in the enjoyment of the moment. The one by making extinction of all feeling and self-deification, that's Stoicism. So just, if you ever watch Star Trek, the Vulcans are kind of Stoics. They're like the Stoic philosophy in the sense that they forbid emotion. They try to go with pure logic. They try to stay away from any kind of pleasurable activities. They just, they just don't do them. Um, but, in the, also, but they also don't self-deify. So they don't believe that men are gods. Men are not gods. The other, the indulgence of every passion and the worship of matter, its ideal. So this is the idea of, you know, live today because God, the gods must want you to have it because it's available. So enjoy. That's just a nutshell. You can, Wikipedia will give you more information than you can actually get a real philosophy book and, you know, really learn more about it if you want. And that under such conditions, all real belief in personal continuance after death must have ceased among the educated classes needs not be demonstrated. So atheism you got to understand, when the Romans were young and on the struggle, when the Romans were building this, you know, this great empire, when they were out, you know, foot soldiers fighting in the field, when they were, you know, people who had to live by the harvest that they made every year, when they didn't have half of the population enslaved, where they had no choice but to make food for them, uh, you had to live every year by what God gave you, or gods, if you prefer, in the Roman sense. So it makes people... Um, religious. It makes people conscientious of what the spiritual side of life is saying to them. It makes them conscientious of how the human life is tuned into this natural world that we're a part of because if the harvest don't come, then people starve to death. So you've got to, you got to work with whatever you got to work with to get that harvest to come. You see God all the time. This is all built into the festivals that God has given his people. Passover, spring, Sukkot, fall. These are the festivals of the harvest. These are the festivals. Shavuot, Pentecost. It's the festival of the wheat harvest. Passover, festival of the Bikurim, the first fruit offering of the grain of the field, which is barley. Barley harvest, wheat harvest. Come Sukkot time, grape harvest. What do you do at Sukkot? You bring strong drink. Why? Because you just made a bunch of grape wine. From all the grapes you brought in because God was so generous with you to give you so much of a harvest. So needless to say, as the Romans, just like Americans, started just buying their food from the grocery store, so to speak, or basically being having it given to them for free, they stopped caring about how God affected the, the food. I mean, because food is a big part of your life. I mean, we're eating three meals a day here in America. You know, who knows with this pandemic that's happening, we might have to start coming back. You know, might be we might not have such a problem with um, 
uh, people getting, uh, you know, in America, we have an obesity problem. I'm sure they have one in Rome, too, because people are so sedentary. They don't have to go out and struggle. They can eat and just enjoy doing nothing if they want to. You know, and I praise God for that. You know, it's it's a great benefit. But there are also times when I praise God that he let me go outside and sweat. Because if you don't go outside and sweat and go outside and do something, your body chemically will begin to function improperly. So, you know, all, all these laws and these feasts and these things that God is teaching his people is to make them function properly. Because we really are. I mean, we're built of flesh. Man is flesh. There is no doubt of that. Now, man's struggle is with his flesh. But he is made of flesh. So he's going to have to struggle with it. And that's just how it goes. Hey, Dan. Good to see you, man. <clears throat> all right both ultimately and of the original nature okay so we, we're discussing how the roman state has basically become it's a welfare state the landed nobles who have money control everything just like they always it's the senate right but now they've got a man that controlled them which is caesar augustus right <clears throat> and he sets policy for the entire empire let's see so everyone has become either all about stoicism which is the denial of the self or they become about epicureanism which is all about the enjoyment of the self everyone's given up basically another worship of the gods all that stuff's falling away people are just becoming um, more atheistic i mean the people with money power easy access to food clothing and shelter they don't care about god no more they are gods to the poor they are the benefactors I mean, it's, I hate, I hate to sound all, uh, you know, uh, Marxian, Marxist here, but I mean, there's such a power dynamic here that the wealthy and powerful just end up feeding the people that are in the middle class and they enslaved everybody that was poor. It's just, you know, that's the system that came out of Rome and that system on the buildup looked grand and amazing, but when you actually get there, it creates sedentary people, it creates well, honestly, a, a huge birth of homosexuality. I know that sounds weird, right? Why would homosexuality be birth? It's what happened at the end of the Roman Empire. Everyone was gay. Everyone was trans. I mean, it's, it, Camille Pagli, a famous lesbian uh, philosopher, has pointed that out. She's like, look, guys. She's like, hey, I'm a lesbian, but um, I can't help but notice that when the Roman Empire was collapsing, there was a whole lot of homosexuality, in the, in, in particularly among the ranks of the people who were in control of things. And here we see Alfred Edersheim pointing out that the family in the Roman Empire has collapsed. It's just not an important part of the empire anymore because the family was strength and stability. It was a strong structure to build from. Well, if you've already got a government that's your family, why do you need a family? And this is one of the problems with socialism in general is that it creates the idea that government is God, government is your family, government is your caretaker. So you stop having families. Because everyone becomes your family in the sense that the government is your mom and daddy. Uh, don't let me, let me get off that soapbox. We'll continue. I'm just saying, even in the Roman Empire, they were having all these problems. That, that Do I want to say wealth brings? Or let's say the love of wealth. The love of money is the root of all evil. So under these conditions, atheism prevailed. People in the educated, wealthy classes, they didn't start, they weren't thinking about dying and going to another life they were living their lives i mean they they when you're poor and you starve every year it's easy to dream about going to heaven because life is hell when life is good people ain't dreaming about where they're going to they're just enjoying being there all right if the older stoics held that after that after death the soul would continue for some time in a separate existence in the case of the sages Till the general destruction of the world by fire. It was the doctrine of most of their successors that immediately after death, the soul returned into a the world soul of which it was a part. So this is this is a concept that's also in Judaism, because of course a lot of concept of Judaism comes from Greek culture and vice versa. This is my kitty cat Yuki. Very sweet kitty. Um like Yuki likes to make biscuits and Brings you and Yuki brings the claws out when Yuki makes biscuits. So, so needless to say, this concept of Stoicism is zeitgeist, right? Or or pantheism, not a pantheon, but um, uh, Spinoza, the philosopher, 
he held this because it's a Jewish concept and he was a Jewish man. I mean, he learned it in, I'm sure, synagogue or his yeshiva, wherever he got educated as a child, he probably heard it talked about a lot. The idea that all life comes from God. So God is all things. God is all life. God is all everything. Everything is God. This is in Shintoism, um, too, in the Japanese culture, which is the idea that everything is a spirit. Everything has a spirit. It is, everything is a part of a, a giant spirit, right? We are the mind of God at work. So this is the concept that the um, Stoics are putting forward, which is it's not a question of dying and resurrecting and serving a God. It's a question of dying and returning to whatever God is and becoming a uh, an eternal aspect of that being, which is beyond understanding. So naturally, you don't have to debate those questions. Those are called metaphysical questions. The word metaphysics is because Aristotle wrote his works and he wrote a book on physics and he put it in the shelf and then he wrote a book on everything else and he called it next to physics. That's meta, next to. So metaphysics means it's the book next to physics. That's what it is. Uh, and when we think metaphysics, we talk about stuff that really is, it's just stuff people make up. It's just nonsense that people came up with because we have imaginations and we are able to think in interesting and, and crazy ways, uh, even to the point that it drives other people insane sometimes. All right, let's continue. The idea that they would return to it, the world soul of which they were a part already. But even this hope was beset by so many doubts and misgivings of which it was part but even this hope was beset by so many doubts I'm say this way without um, to make it practically without influence or comfort Cicero was the one who following Plato defended the immortality of the soul why Peripacitus um, denied the existence of a soul at all and the leading Stoics uh, at least its continuance after death. So they were debating, you know, is there even a soul? This is the stuff you hear in churches all the time. This is not Jewish. This is not Israel. This is not the religion of God. This is the religion of the Greeks. This is the religion of the Roman Empire. You know, is there a soul? Where does the soul go? Is there a mind, a body, and a spirit? All this stuff was the, the debates of Greek philosophers. This was not Jewish stuff. This was not a part of Israel. Uh, it became a part of Israel under the Pharisees because they were educated, um, particularly getting uh, strong influences from the uh, Jews in Alexandria who were literally in the middle of a, a, a Greek-controlled state. Egypt was controlled by Ptolemy for a very long time. In fact, uh, his great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter was Cleopatra, the famous you know, amazingly beautiful woman that the, what's her name played in the 50s or 60s, I don't know, Joan Collins, I think, I don't know. Anyway, she was supposed to have, you know, legendary beauty, and of course, when you actually see coins of her, she has a, a big old weird nose, and she looks like a Jewish girl, sort of, she looks like a Greek girl, um, because she's not Egyptian, she's not from Egypt, she's not from Africa, she's from Greece, and you know, her people were, were from the other side of the Mediterranean. All right. So the Stoics believed that, you know, they were arguing, was there even a continuation of, of the soul? Uh, Cicero says he doubts there's a soul at all. His contemporaries, you know, when you, when you start having these thoughts, it leads to despair. The only comfort lying in the present indulgence of the passions, and this is Epicureanism, even among the Greeks who were most tenacious in the belief in the non-existence, the non, sorry, the non-extinction of the individual, the practical ups, upshot was the same. So here we go. Here's Greek philosophy in the church. The Greeks are saying that they believe that if there is a soul, then it is eternal, and you are it, and it continues on forever. But, is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Word of God says? It looks to me like it says that there will be, be a time when what you were will be tried in fire, and that all that is made of wood, hay, and stubble will be burned away. So obviously, everything of who you are will not continue. Only those things which you did for God will continue. So the echo of you throughout eternity will be the one who served God. And everything you did for yourself will turn to ashes and blow away because there's it has no value is the, the basis of it. All right, even among the Greeks uh, 
who were most tenacious of the belief of the non-extinction of the individual, the practical upshot was the same. The only healthier tendency, however, mixed with error, came from the Neoplatonic school, which accordingly offered a point of contact between ancient philosophy and the new faith. In such circumstances, anything like real religion was manifestly impossible. I'd like to say we are now two pages in <laughs> to this probably 25-page chapter. Um, this book is extremely filled with detail. This book, this is for people who aren't, don't know, I don't know who's watching, but uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. He was the leading scholar on everything Jewish uh, in the late 1800s among Anglican priests. He was an Anglican. He was born to a Jewish family. They converted to Anglicanism. And uh, he ended up growing up to be a, an Anglican priest who was the world's authority on everything involving Judaism, the Talmud, the Mishnah, all that. But also a Christian, but also born a Jew. So, you know, he had a very unique perspective, which is one I very much like because it's nice to see. It's nice to see someone who actually knows not just the history of Rome, but also the history of Israel, also the teachings of the Pharisees, also the writings in the Talmud, also the writings in the Mishnah, also the Gemara, also all the Jewish mysticism that was alive and kicking at this time that was deeply influenced by Greek concepts of the spirit and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> In such circumstances, anything like real religion was manifestly impossible. Rome tolerated and indeed incorporated all national rights. You can understand, when the Romans took over somewhere, they would go to a land, they would find out what its God's name was, and they would make a sacrifice to that God. They would say, look, God, whatever your name is, we are the Romans. We know how to get things done, and we will get you your sacrifices. We will get you your money. Hey, we're going to... Let me put on my mobster voice. Hey, these guys don't do what you're supposed to. Hey, we'll get you your money. Okay, we'll get you money. I'll get you your money. It's basically the way the Romans did. And they would make deals with the local deities. And they would say, look, we went to your local deity. We talked to them. And we told them we're going to get them paid. Because y'all ain't paying them. Because y'all ain't doing what they want. So we're going to make sure y'all do what they want. And that's how the Romans would do it. I mean, that was the religious side of warfare. It wasn't just, you know crushing people with your military might, you also crush their spiritual might, you know, just in case there actually was some there. <clears throat> but among the populous regions, uh, they had de degenerated into abject superstition. In the East, much of it consisted of the vilest rites, while among philosophers, all religions were considered equally false or equally true, the outcome of ignorance or else the unconscious modification of some one fundamental thought. Okay, so the philosophers said, well, you know, all religions are the same. Everybody uh, is, is trying to find this divine thing, and they're just shooting in the dark, doing their best with what they got. Or other philosophers are like, look, y'all, there's a reason God's invisible, because he ain't there. There's no God. It's just us. Here we are. Deal with it. You know, let's, let's live in peace and harmony, or let's kill each other. You know, it's, it's just us. Stop trying to drag somebody else in who ain't there. You know, this is obviously not what I think. I'm telling you what, and this is this is not new. None of what I, nothing new under the sun, y'all. Solomon had, was filled with the wisdom of man. Not the wisdom of God, but the wisdom of man. And he did understand one thing. There is nothing new under the sun. People have been saying the same junk for generations. People have been wasting their time and talking about the same nonsense for thousands of years. All right, let's continue. Uh, the only religion on which the state is insisted was the deification and the worship of the emperor because that's some, the emperor's new. We have to make sure everybody in this empire from the time... Listen, if you want to... Okay, let me give you a, a for instance here. In the 1980s, there was, an, uh, there was an, uh, 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 a cartoon camel, Joe Camel, who sold camel cigarettes. Now, it was pointed out at that time that that should be banned because that was marketing particularly targeted at children because, and, and by the way, in the 50s, in the cartoon shows, they'd be advertising cigarettes directly to children. And the car, you spread, first don't be smoking up. 
be smoking cigarettes, talking to Barney between the commercial breaks. Smoking Marlboros. Okay. If you want to get somebody hooked on something, you got to get them hooked on it young. Okay. That's how you make a lifelong follower. You get them while they're young. So the emperor is taught as a god to every child that comes up. It doesn't matter what the adults think. We can oppress them with force. But the next generation, we won't have to oppress them. They'll oppress each other. Because half of them will think the emperor really is a god, and the other half will be, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, no matter what I think. Because I know there's some people who will kill me if I start saying the emperor ain't a god. Or I will be banned. And this is one of the good things, by the way, about um, early Christians, who really are just sects of Jews, is that they said, I ain't going to do that. And I ain't going to teach my kids that. I refuse to let the government tell me that it is God. It's just I'm not going to let them do it. You know, I will honor the government. I will certainly accept that it is ma it, God put it there for a reason. But not to challenge him. He put it there to be a terror unto evil. All right. The only religion that the state insisted on was that you must worship the emperor. These apotheoses attained almost incredible development. So you understand, when this religion took off, it took off. <clears throat> Soon, not only the emperor, but his wives, his concubines, his paramours, this is women involved with him, his children, and the creatures of the supervisors possessed with sufficient means. So if also anyone who was rich enough to be in the imperial court, those people are also gods. So at first it was emperor, and then it moved straight on to his wives. Oh, yeah, it was, of course his wife, because God must marry other gods. And any child that comes out of him is obviously a god, so God, his children are gods. And any woman that has sex with him uh, must be a god too. So they're gods. And uh, anyone who's rich enough to be, have his ear also a god. They must all be worshipped. Okay, this is the cult of the emperor, by the way. This is what we mentioned earlier. All right. Nay, any private person might attain that distinction if the survivors possessed sufficient means. So if you were rich enough and powerful enough, you could work your way into being one of the gods in the imperial cult. Mingled with all this was an interesting amount of superstition, by which term some understood the worship of foreign gods. The most <clears throat> part of existence of fear in religion. The ancient Roman religion had long given place to foreign rites. The more mysterious and unintelligible, the more enticing. The more people speaking in tongues, lay hands on, prophesying the future, the more enticing it is to people. God's law is God's religion. That's it. It's the law which sets people free. You're no longer slave to other people. You become slave to God. Okay, that's why the Apostle Paul said specifically, I am a dolos slave. I, I belong to Christ. I don't have my own opinion. I don't get, I mean, I can think, but I can't do what I want to do. I obey him in what he instructs. You know, I understand. And what does he instruct? He instructs what's in that Torah because he's the living Torah. He's the living word. The word was with God and the word was God. And what is the instruction that God gives? It is the Torah. It's the words of Moses, obviously. So, you know, whether you think that Jesus was in the tent with Moses or God had all that coming in the future, it doesn't matter. The, the result is the same. The law has been given. If you obey it, then things will work well for you. If you don't, sword, famine, plague. Those are your rewards for disobedience. <clears throat> all right. The ancient Roman religion, again, have, have, they had no problem to letting other people bring in their religious practices. And the weirder and the crazier and the stranger, awesome, because we all love a good show. Okay, that's another part of being human. Lust of the eyes, we like what we see. Lust of the flesh, we like the way things taste. The pride of life, we love power. We love having power. We love having the power to heal. The power to, to see the future. The power to do whatever it is we think we want it's all about the pride of life mingled with all the increasing amount 
It was thus that Judaism made its converts in Rome. Its chief recommendation, with many being its contrast to the old and the unknown possibilities which its seemingly incredible doctrines had opened. Among the most repulsive systems of the general religious decay may be reckoned prayers for the death of a rich relative, or even of the satisfaction of unnatural lust, along with the horrible blasphemies when such prayers remained unanswered. We may here contrast the spirit of the Old and the New Testaments with such sentiments as this on the tomb of a child. And he's reading the quote from a, the tomb of a child. To the unjust gods who robbed me of life. <clears throat> or on that of the girl of 20, quote, I lift my hand, I lift my hands against the God who took me away innocent as I am. So this is things that were written on tombstone, right? It would be unsavory to describe how far the worship of indecency was carried, how public morals were corrupted by the mimic representations of everything that was vile, and even by the pandering of corrupt art, the personation of gods, oracles, divinations, dreams, astrology, magic, necromancy, thermatology, all contributed to the general decay. It has been rightly said that the idea of conscience, as we understand it, was unknown to heathenism. <clears throat> Absolute right and wrong did not exist. Might was right. Which, by the way, that's what it is still for a lot of people. Might is right. Whoever has who, who, a golden rule. Whoever has gold makes rules. That's the golden rule, right? Might makes right. If you have the power to enforce what you want, then you get to decide what you want. That's might makes right. Okay, all these things stand in, stand counter to what God has said. If you choose atheism, it's fine. Then you choose might is right. And you choose that gold makes the rules. Because that's all that there is. There's no other choice. There's no, oh, I'm an atheist, but, I, but I'm a moral person. What is morality? That's a nonsense, made-up dream. There's no objective morality. Immanuel Kant spent his entire life trying to come up with a consistent system of morality. He wrote a book this thick trying to come up with an objective stance on morality. And he got just about everything figured out until he couldn't figure out why murder was wrong. He couldn't prove logically that murder was wrong. Something that every person with an ounce of decency understands. Murder is wrong. Okay? Couldn't prove it. Did everything he could. He, had, he created and he wrote, he wrote the critique of pure reason to build a foundation of logic so that he could prove his moral theory, which was basically the moral theory of Christianity. It's basically what he was trying to do. And he got he managed to rope it all in except the fact <clears throat> that he couldn't prove murder was evil. He couldn't prove it was morally reprehensible. <clears throat> and I think it was probably because at the end of the line he said, look, I gotta help y'all understand. There is no objective morality. We a bunch of wild animals out here pretending to be civilized without God. God had to step into this world and say, do you want to be kings or do you want to be slaves? That was the choice laid out before Israel as they left Egypt. King or slave? And even the king is slave to God. All right. Be humble as Moses. And that's the lesson. All right. All, all these things that were happening in the Roman Empire contributed to the general decay. Um, the absolute right did not exist. The social relations ex exhibited, if possible, even deeper corruption. The sanctity of marriage had ceased. Female <laughs> dissipation and the general dissoluteness led at last to an almost entire cessation of marriage. This is the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. Almost an, no men were getting married. There's a movement going on today, today called MGTOW, men going their own way. <clears throat> Where men were once taught to be noble, to be chivalrous, and women were taught to support that man because he needs that help. Women are now taught you don't need a man. And what men have learned is, if a woman don't need him, 
then there's no point in going after them. That's what men have learned. Men are going their own way. They're staying home and playing video games. They're just having sex with whoever has sex with them. They're not trying to build a family. They're not trying to marry a girl. Why, why would you marry a girl? As soon as she leaves you, she gets half your stuff, at least. No matter what you do. You can't beat them in court. Try getting divorced and having children. See who them children are going to go to. If that woman ain't in jail, them children are going to go to her. And who's going to be paying child support? It's going to be the man. It ain't going to be the woman. Who's going to be getting alimony? It'll be the woman, not the man. Okay? That's what everybody knows. Same thing was happening in ancient Rome. We have This is not new. There is nothing new under the sun. At the time of Christ, what is happening today was happening. Because... Life just continues. It's a, it's a cycle. You can either learn to understand it, see it, move with it, and step outside of it and be set apart, or you're just going to keep walking the same walk that everyone walks. That's the nature of life. It is a circle. Spring, summer, fall, winter, birth, adolescence, adulthood, death. That's life. It continues endlessly until the day the, the clouds part. That's how things are going to work. Okay? <clears throat> but among these sad signs of the times, three must be specially mentioned. The treatment of slaves, the bearing towards the poor, and public amusements. The slave was entirely unprotected. Males and females were exposed to nameless cruelties, compared to which death by being thrown to wild beasts or fighting in the arena might seem an absolute relief. Sicker old slaves were cast out to perish from want. So if you had an older sick slave, throw them out in the street. Like, good luck. You ain't a slave no more. Nobody's going to take you in because ain't nobody going to pay for you. You'll probably just die of starvation in the street. And let me tell you, People used to die of starvation, folks. People used to die from having no food to eat. When the Spanish flu hit, children in cities were dying of starvation because their parents had died of the flu. Well, I mean, it's really H1N1. I mean, it's another, it's a coronavirus. It's what it is. It's not the real, it's not the flu. That wasn't what happened to them. They got, they had another, they had a pandemic just like we're having now. Pandemic hit, coronavirus hit them 100 years ago. Okay. Children were starving to death because their parents were dead and nobody else was going to take care of them children. That was the 19 teens in America. Yeah, you live in the lap of luxury. You can live in a hood today. And I guarantee you, there'll be two big screen, flat panel, internet ready televisions, at least, in any house living on a welfare check today. And I guarantee you, that house has got air conditioning. And I guarantee you, that house has running water. And I guarantee you, there's food in that refrigerator. We live in the lap of luxury compared to the way people were living 100 years ago. Okay, and we come to expect it. Instead of and instead of us saying, God, thank you for making my life so easy, we say, When's my next thing coming? When's my next free thing? When do I get what I want next? When is my next lust satisfied? When's the next lust of my eye? I watch TV, look how much money, look at their mansions, look at their gold, look at their jewels, look at their beautiful clothes. Give me what I see with my eyes. You know the word pornography? Pornografia? It's eyes. It's what you see. Iconography. Icon. Icon. It's what you see. An iconography. Pornografia is to worship what you see. We think pornography, we think naked people having sex. No. No, it means you worship what you see. Because you don't get to participate in what they're doing. You just get to watch. Right? You just get to see it with your eyes. Lust of the flesh, the free food. Oh, God. 
checks are coming in. Well, you listen. Remember Will Smith had that song? Was it uh no with Chris that was Chris Rock did a he's a comedy, he's, he's talking about Bone Thugs and Harmony singing about um the welfare check coming in and eating good. He said, "Well, we got welfare Christmas carols now." Nothing new. Same thing has always been. The world has not changed. We're just doing some front porch sitting out here in lovely South Georgia, talking, keeping it real, talking about what the Bible says, talking about what Mr. Alfred Edersheim. Wants to share with us. Pet the kitty cat. Nothing new under the sun. I think that's the point right now. So with the ancient Romans. <clears throat> among the treatments of the slave. Sick or, soul, sick or old were cast out to die. But what influence of the slave must have been on the free population, and especially upon the young whose tutors they generally were, may readily be imagined. The heartlessness towards the poor who crowded the city is another well-known feature of Roman society. Of course, there were neither hospitals nor provisions for the poor. Charity and brotherly love in their every manifestation was purely an Old and New Testament idea. Charity is a New and Old Testament idea. This is Jewish thought, not Roman thought. Okay? This is, the Romans more pull yourself up by your bootstraps, go find something. Jewish is let's help each other, okay? But even the bestowal of the smallest alms on the needy was regarded as very questionable. You understand when you want when you when you were poor, if you got a little something, you go and walk in front of the man that gave it to you in the street, proclaiming his glory that he was a great caregiver of people. And this was typically the kind of thing that would happen in Jerusalem, where Jews like to get known as somebody who is generous. It's not common in the Roman Empire in general. This is, a, this is something that would happen. Uh, that's that Roman influence into the Jewish mind, which is, I'm not going to be humble. I'm not going to, this is why Christ said, if you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, right? You don't need to get loud and you don't need to boast before the other people and before God of what you have done. God knows what you've done. But that, that's his job. He knows what you've done. All right. Uh, but even the most the smallest bestowal of alms is very questionable. Best not to afford them the means of protracting a useless existence. Lastly, the account which Seneca has to give of what occupied and amused the idle multitude for all manual labor except agriculture was looked upon as almost contempt. So the only thing you would even look, people would even accept you doing is being a farmer. That's it. Horrified even himself. And so the only escape which remained for the philosopher and the satiated or the miserable seemed the power of self-destruction. So here we go. Here comes, the, here comes the bust out of suicide. Suicide's on the rise. What is worse, the noblest spirits of the time felt that the state of things was utterly hopeless. Society could not reform um, itself philosophy and religion had nothing to offer they had been tried and found wanting Seneca longed for some hand from with, from without to lift up from the mire of despair Cicero pictured the enthusiasm which would greet the embodiment of true virtue should it ever appear on earth Tacitus declared human life one great farce and expressed his conviction that Ro the Roman world lay under some terrible curse so like one of the great philosophers of the time, the poets, Tacitus, he said, life is a farce. Our life is a joke. We struggled, built an empire, gave food. We got food coming out our noses. We've enslaved half the people in the world to us. We are as wealthy and as, as powerful as it can get. And we are not happy. We are a joke. Okay? This is because the Romans were coming to terms with the fact that when you accumulate wealth and power and then you let go of God and you tell yourself you're God what you realize you really are is dead 
You're just waiting to die. That's it. You're just waiting to die without him. God is life. Lachaim, God is life. Without him, there is no life. Okay? Latin, and I'm, I'm just, this is, this is the words of Romans who were living at the time. And just the, just the malaise. That's a French word, malaise. Ennui, the ennui. A deep depression that was behind everything and everyone's eyes. Because their lives had become meaningless. Without God, life becomes meaningless. Our promise is a resurrection to service. Not a resurrection unto pleasure. Heaven ain't streets of gold. Heaven is serving in the holy place. You know where the streets of gold are? They're in the tabernacle. Because the room where they kept the Ark of the Covenant was gold. That's the street of gold. It's the presence of God. And what's in that ark? Manna feeds you every day. His law, the ten words, and the staff of Aaron, which budded. Okay? That's what's there. That's what's in that golden room. That is what we aspire to. The high priest was the only person even allowed into that room. Because it was so holy, so set apart from everything else. But we did know what was in it. You want to be set apart? That's what needs to be in you. You're the temple of the living God. Them ten words need to be in you. You need to understand he's going to feed you every day. And you need to accept the authority that was given to Moses over your life. Okay? It wasn't to it wasn't to cripple you. It wasn't to make you Moses' slave or Moses' servant. It was to teach you to be a king shoulder to shoulder with Moses. It was to teach you to rule and to reign in righteousness. You are a royal priesthood. You were meant to be kings and priests. That is your destiny. If you accept it. And that's the hard part, right? Slave to somebody. You're always going to be a slave. We talk, we're reading about slaves right now in the Roman Empire. You will always be a slave to someone. You can be slave to God. You can be slave to men. You can be slave to your own flesh. But you will be slave to someone. Because let me tell you, there is no you. As you go through life, I just said you. I said there's no you and then I referred to you, right? As you go through life, you will realize that everything you have done for yourself is pointless, meaningless, worthless. It was a moment. And it was the moment that only you got to have. When you die, those moments are gone. Okay? Your, you can write your history book. You can do whatever you want. You can record all your memoirs. Eventually, no one else will read them. Eventually, they will all rot and turn to dust. And no one will remember you. On your resurrection, you will be cleansed of those things that you did. Washed in a fire, right? Cleansed in a fire until nothing remains but the gold. The gold, the silver, and the precious stone, or the bronze, if you prefer. Which is all that was in the tabernacle. All that will remain is him, what you did for him, and how you participated in him. Because he is who is alive. We are beings of flesh. We are here today and gone tomorrow. Our only hope is that he will bring us back to serve him so that our lives do not become meaningless. Do you understand? The only thing worse than living forever is living forever and wishing you were dead. Living forever and wishing you could kill yourself because you can't take it anymore. Because your life has become an empty void. That's what we're reading about. The void in the Roman hearts. People in Rome were converting to Judaism. Because the rich life had failed them. All right. <clears throat> oh, 
the only thing that remained for the philosopher and the satiated and the miserable was the power of self-destruction, suicide. What is worse? And the worst kind of suicide. Okay, there's suicide. Blow your own brains out. Obviously suicide. Hang yourself. Obviously suicide. Take a bunch of pills. People find you dead. Obviously suicide. There's other types of suicide. Slow death. Killing not just yourself, but the other people around you with your tongue. Murder is in your mouth, right? If you speak evil towards your brother, then you've murdered him, right? You murder from your mouth, and it murders you. Unforgiveness murders you. What we do to the world murders us slowly. God wants you alive and happy. He don't want you alive and miserable. Or should I say dead and miserable? All right. Seneca longed for someone to come and just lift everyone out of the mire. This is a Messiah, right? Cicero pictured the enthusiasm which would greet the embodiment of true virtue should it appear on earth. He's like, oh, we're just waiting for someone to come and show us what good, what being good really is. That's what we're waiting on. Tacitus declared human life a great farce. It's like, this is a joke, man. Everything we have achieved is nothing and expressed his conviction that the Roman world lay under some terrible curse. All around, despair, conscious need, and unconscious longing can greater contrast be imagined than the proclamation of the coming kingdom of God amid such a world, or clearer evidence be afforded of the reality of the divine message than that it came to seek and to save that which was lost. So that was the message John the Baptist preached. The kingdom of God is at hand. He's coming to seek and to save what has been lost. And everyone around the entire empire felt like they were the people that were lost. Okay? It's happening in America. People feel lost. Tell you what, after 9-11, churches filled up. People were showing up to go to church. And that, 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 went, that, that went away. You know, it, it closed down. People have bouts and spouts where they... Uh, feel like they want to be connected to God when, when something terrible happens, stuff like that. Same thing was happening back in the day. <clears throat> and yet among all this, it is proclaimed that the kingdom of God is at hand. A divine message <clears throat> that he has come to seek and to save that which is lost. One syncretism, as remarkable as that of the star in the east and the birth of the Messiah, here claims the reverent attention of the student of history. On the 19th of December, A.D. 69, the Roman capital with its ancient sanctuaries was set on fire. Remember, Nero burned as, Nero fiddled as Rome burned, is the, the famous statement, right? <clears throat> Eight months later, on the 9th of Av, A.D. 70, the Temple of Jerusalem was given to the flames. It is not a coincidence, but a conjunction. For upon the ruins of heathenism, and the apostate Judaism was the Church of Christ to be reared. Okay, so with these, so he's saying basically the Roman Empire burns, the, the temple in Jerusalem burns. Nine months later, the, the birth is the burning of the temple in Jerusalem. Right? The founding of the change is the burning of the Roman capital. The fruition of the change is the burning of the temple. Because that's where people have to start accepting that they are the temple of the living God. God does not be, live in hand. God does not live in houses built with human hands. He builds the houses he lives in. That's us. He built us. We didn't build ourselves. Our parents participated in the creation of us by giving seed, but he did everything else. He's the one that took care of all them other details that got us to where we are. He built a house to live in. <clears throat> A silence even more complete than that concerning the early life of Yeshua rests on the 30 years or more which intervene between the birth and the open forth showing of John in his character as forerunner of the Messiah. Only his outward and inward development and his being, quote, in the deserts, unquote, are briefly indicated in Luke 1.80. The latter assuredly not in order to learn from the Essenes, but to attain really in the, in the lonely fellowship with God. 
what they saw externally. It is characteristic that while you got to remember, <clears throat> his daddy was a was a priest. Okay, his daddy presented the offering at the temple. His daddy presented the, the, the fragrant offering before God. That's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a priest. They drew lots. Uh, he'd been pulling that lot since the day he started his, for years, he had been pulling that lot, hoping he'd get to be the one to do it. Never got it. You priest was allowed to do it one time. You drew the lot, you get to do it. The last time you ever get to do it, let somebody else have a chance. That's the way the system works. In lonely fellowship with God, what they saw externally, it is characteristic that while Yeshua could go straight from the home and workshop of Nazareth to the baptism in the Jordan, his forerunner required so long and peculiar preparation, characteristic of the difference of their persons and mission, characteristic also of the greatness of the work to be inaugurated. St. Luke furnishes precise notices of the time of the Baptist's public appearance not merely to fix the exact chronology, which would not have required so many details, but for a higher purpose. For they indicate more clearly than the most elaborate discussion the fitness of the moment for the advent of, quote, the kingdom of heaven, unquote. For the first time since the Babylonian captivity, the foreigner, the chief of the hated Roman Empire, according to the rabbis, the fourth beast of Daniel's vision. Rabbis, yes, the, the beast of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, obviously, because what are the beasts? They're the kingdoms that are around Israel. They're the kingdoms of the enemies of Israel, right? Babylon, boom, head of gold, first beast. Medo-Persian Empire, body of silver, second beast, the bear with the uh, bones of an old kingdom in its mouth, right? Third, uh, four-winged, the, the four-headed winged beast, the skirt of bronze, it's the Greeks. The Greeks are the ones that came and conquered the Medo-Persians. It was Alexander the Great who conquered them and then took over Israel. And then his kingdom was divided into four, which is the four-headed beast. And where Ptolemy at first ruled Israel, it was then taken over by the Seleucids, which is where you get Antiochus Epiphanes from. So the fourth beast, the great and terrible beast, the fourth beast, is the Roman Empire. This is the one who comes and is given the authority. The beasts come because they're given authority over Israel. They become Israel's caretaker. Since the people of Israel will not caretake Israel, God instead sends someone else, a beast, someone who knows how to deal with flesh, and comes and sends in those who can deal with the flesh of men. <clears throat> All right. The fourth beast of Daniel's vision was absolute and undisputed master of Judea, and the chief religious office divided between two, equally unworthy of its function. It deserves at least notice that the rulers mentioned by St. Luke, Pilate entered on his office only shortly before the public appearance of John, and that they all continued until after the crucifixion of Christ. There was thus, so to speak, a continuity of these powers during the whole Messianic period. As regards Palestine, the ancient kingdom of Herod was now divided into four parts. Tetrarch, right. Tetrarch of Galilee. Four, four kingdoms. Tetra, four. <clears throat> Tetragrammaton. Four-letter name of God. yod heh vav -Heh, is the Tetragrammaton. Okay. As regards Palestine, the ancient kingdom was divided into four parts. Judea being under the direct administration of Rome. That's where Pontius Pilate was. Two other tetrarchies under the rule of Herod's sons. Herod Antipas, and Philip, while the small principality of Abilene was governed by Lysanias. Of the latter, no detail can be furnished, nor any are there necessarily any in history. It is otherwise as regarded the sons of Herod, especially the character of the Roman government at the time. So whoever this guy Lysanias was, we don't know much about him. We just know his name. We don't know really what he did. Herod Antipas, that's Herod's son, whose rule extended over 43 years, reigned over Galilee and the Perea, the districts which were respectively the principal sphere of the ministry of Yeshua and John the Baptist. So Galilee's northern kingdom, right? Samaria, the northern kingdom. Galilee, of course, where the, the Sea of Galilee, the big lake, the Sea of Galilee is, um, which the Jordan River flows out of and flows down from, right? So that would have been who the, who the 
political figure would have been in most of what that they had involvement with uh, because they lived in Galilee and Herod Antipas was their direct ruler. <clears throat> like his brother Archelaus, Herod Antipas possessed an even aggravated form of most vices without any of the great qualities of his father, of the deep religious feelings or the convictions he was entirely destitute, though his conscience occasionally, mis occasionally misgave if it did not restrain him, the inherent weakness of his character left him in the absolute control of his wife and the final ruin of his fortunes. He was covetous, avaricious, luxurious, and utterly dissipated, suspicious, and with a good deal of that fox cunning which, especially in the East, Austin forms the sum total of statecraft. Like his father, he indulged in a taste for building, always taking care to propitiate propitiate Rome by dedicating all to the emperor. So in other words, he would he would build. Uh, Herod Antipas was also a big builder of monuments to Rome's glory in Israel because you got to always appease and appeal to the Romans. You got to keep them on your side. Appeal well, appeal to the emperor. The most extensive of his undertakings was the building in 22 A.D. of the city of Tiberias at the upper end of the Lake of Galilee. The site was under the disadvantage of having formerly been a burying place, which, by implying Levitical uncleanliness, for some died some time deterred pious Jews from settling there. So, like this is a burial ground, this is a burial mound. We're not going to Jews don't go to graveyards. We're not going to go to this burial mound. We're not going to touch dead things and make us unclean, right? Nevertheless. It rose in great magnificence from among the reeds which had been lately covered the neighborhood. The ensigns armorally of the city were reeds. So the symbol for that city was that it was a city of reeds, right? The city of reeds. That is the city of Tiberias. Herod Antipas made it his residence and built there a strong castle and a palace of unrivaled splendor. The city, which was peopled chiefly by adventurers, was mainly Grecian and adorned with an amphitheater which was the which uh, of which the ruins can still be placed uh, you have to remember galilee is at the intersection of the trade routes the silk roads the stuff that run to china so international trade came through at the side like we're at the eastern side of the mediterranean right so these trade routes are coming in and you can go north and head up into uh, anatolia or into greece or macedonia what we call Turkey today, or you can go south down into Africa, down into Egypt, and go trade there, or you can go east uh, into Babylon and then onward into India, and, and you go into China too. You know, it's a this is a hub for trade. International routes are meeting in Galilee, so it's a great place to collect taxes and, and, and excise money from people who are traveling through. As a Roman governor, it would have been a very profitable place to live. Obviously, why he was able to afford to build all these buildings to the emperor. <clears throat> a happier account can be given of Philip, the son of Herod the Great and Cleopatra of Jerusalem. He was undoubtedly the best of Herod's sons. He showed indeed the same abject submission as the rest of his family to the Roman emperor, after whom he had named the city of Caesarea Philippi, Caesar and Philip, you know, which he built at the sources of the river Jordan just as he changed the name of Bethsaida, a village which he had made an opulent city, into Julius, after the daughter of Augustus. But he was a moderate and just ruler, and his reign of 37 years contrasted favorably with that of his kinsmen. The land was quiet and prosperous, and the people contented and happy. As regards the Roman rule, matters had greatly changed for the worse since the mild sway of Augustus, under which, in the language of Philo, no one throughout the empire dared to molest the Jews. So while Caesar Augustus was on the throne, no Roman dared molest the Jews. Okay? So he's saying to you right there, Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar were friends to the Jews. The only innovation to which Israel had then to submit were the daily sacrifices for the emperor and the Roman people, which they did at the temple. They made offerings for them offerings on festive days, prayers for them in the synagogues, and such participation in national joy or sorrow as their religion allowed. So it's like, so if the Romans have a celebration, if it's cool for y'all to celebrate with us, come on, celebrate. If it's not, you don't have to celebrate this festival. But you do have to pray for us to your gods 
you have to sacrifice for us to your gods. Or in this case, your God, Yehovah Elohim. It was far from the other that Tiberius succeeded to the empire, and Judea was a province. Merciless, harshness characterized the administration of Palestine, while the emperor himself was bitterly hostile to Judaism and to the Jews, and that although per this is Emperor Tiberius, you got to remember, Tiberius fought a war against the Jews. Okay, that's uh, him and Vespasian. They they literally had to siege Jerusalem. <clears throat> while the emperor himself was bitterly hostile to Judaism and to the Jews, and that although personally openly careless of all religion, he didn't have a particular religion he, he was a part of. Under his reign, the persecution of the Roman Jews occurred, and Palestine suffered almost to the verge of endurance. The first procreator from whom Tiberius appointed over Judea changed the occupancy of the high priesthood four times till he found in Caiaphas a sufficiently submissive instrument for Roman tyranny. So Caiaphas was appointed by this particular Roman governor, or sorry, this Roman uh, Tiberius, but he was the fourth choice in a short reign till he could finally find somebody who would work with Rome. And you gotta understand, he didn't like the, he didn't like the Jews, okay? He's not, he's not Augustus. The next emperor was not like Augustus was. Um, the exact the exactions and the reckless disregard of all Jewish feelings and interests might have been characterized as reaching its extreme limit, if worse not followed when the Pontius Pilate succeeded to the procuratorship venally, violently, through robbery and persecutions, wanton mal malicious insults, judicial murders without even the formality of a legal trial, and cruelty such as the charges brought against his administration, if former governors had to some extent respected the religious uh, scruples of the Jews, Pilate set them purposely in defiance, and this not only once, but again and again in Jerusalem, and in Galilee, and in Samaria, and upon the emperor, and upon which the emperor himself had imposed. Okay, so Pontius Pilate was appointed from the Roman government, right? Because Emperor Tiberius didn't like emperoring. He didn't like being, he didn't like, he liked getting, he liked being rich, he liked being powerful, he liked hanging out in his private island. Okay, so he had a Roman general that was under him who actually appointed Pontius Pilate. That Roman general, by the way, was executed before the end of the emperor because he was framed, even though the man literally threw himself onto the emperor to protect him from a landslide that was going to kill him. The man protected the emperor from rocks smack we were going to crush him. He was eventually executed for treason against the emperor, right? He's the one that appointed Pilate. So Pilate's there under appointment. His general that had appointed him was executed in Rome. Then you get Christ coming to be crucified, and the Jews are like, look, we're going to tell Caesar you ain't doing what you want to, and he's going to know it's because you're in league with the guy that got you this appointment, who, who the emperor just had executed, right? So everything's falling into place for God's will to be done. No matter what Pilate thinks, even Pilate does not like the Jews. He doesn't like the way they do things. He doesn't like that, they're, that they give him nonsense. He built, he put soldiers in the fortress Antonia so they could constantly watch the uh, the, the court, uh, which is in front of the temple. And when Yeshua went up in there and overturned the money changers tables, the Roman guards should have come out and arrested him, but they didn't. I mean, you gotta understand, there was some definite tension between the Roman rulership and the Jews, particularly around the their religious practices at that time. It hadn't been previously during the younger life of Christ, but by the time of his ministry, yeah, there was there was plenty of tension, and plenty of tension in the empire because, like I said, Pontius Pilate knew at any moment he might get executed, just like his former boss had been executed, if any complaint went up about him. All right. Such then was the political condition of the land that when John appeared to preach the near advent of a kingdom with which Israel was associated, all that was happy and glorious, even beyond the dreams of the religious enthusiasts, and equally loud was the call for help in reference to those who held chief 
spiritual rule over the people. St. Luke significantly joins together as the, re the highest religious authority in the land the names of Annas and Caiaphas. The former had been appointed by Quirinius after holding the pontificate for nine years. He was deposed and succeeded by others, of whom the fourth was his son-in-law, Caiaphas. The character of the high priest during the whole of that period is described in the Talmud in very terrible language. And although this is no evidence that the house of Annas was guilty of the same gross self-indulgence or violence or luxury or even public indecency as some of their successors, they are included in the woes pronounced on the corrupt leaders of the priesthood whom the sanctuary was represented as, binding de as bidding depart from the sacred precincts which their presence defiled. It deserves notice that the special sin with which the house of Annas is charged is that of whispering or hissing like vipers, which seems to refer to private influence on the judges in their administration of justice. Remember, when it says in the Bible that the sin of witchcraft is forbidden, that, that word means whispering. When it says witchcraft, it says whispering. So they're being accused of witchcraft. That is to say, influencing subtly through Power, powerful deceptions and, uh, and and influences that you don't want other people to know you have or that you use. Okay, that's witchcraft. All right, let's see here. Uh, guilty of the self indulgence, bidding and depart from the sacred precincts, whispering or hissing like vipers, which seems to refer to private influence on the judges in their administration of justice, whereby morals were corrupted, judgment perverted, and the Shekinah withdrawn from Israel. So he's saying in the in the in one of the tractates in the Talmud said this is when the Shekinah was removed from Israel. In illustrate illustri illustration of this, we recall the terrorism which prevented the Sanhedrin from taking the part of Yeshua, and especially the violence which seemed to have determined the final action of the Sanhedrin, against which not only such men as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, but even of Gamaliel would feel themselves powerless, but although the expression high priest appears sometimes to have been used in a general sense as designating the sons of the high priest and even the principal members of their families, there could of course be only one actual high priest. The conjunction of the two names of Annas and Caiaphas probably indicates that although Annas was deprived of the pontificate, he still continued to preside over the Sanhedrin, a conclusion not only borne out in Acts 4.6 where Annas appears as the actual president of the Sanhedrin, and by the terms in which Caiaphas was spoken of as merely, quote, one of them, but by the part which Annas took in the final condemnation of Yeshua. Such a combination of political and religious distress surely constituted the time of Israel's utmost need. As yet, no attempt had been made by the people to right themselves by armed force in these circumstances. The cry that the kingdom of heaven was at hand and the call to preparation for it must have awakened echoes throughout the land and startled the most careless and unbelieving. It was according to St. Luke's exact statement in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, reckoning as provincials would do. <laughs> reckoning by his co-regency with Augustus, which commenced two years before his sole reign in the year of 26 AD. According to the former computation, Yeshua would have been in his 13th year. So he would have been getting, he's getting bar mitzvahed when Tiberius is ascending. Okay. The scene of John's first public appearance was in the wilderness of Judea. That is the wild, desolate, desolate district around the mouth of the river Jordan. We know not where John baptized in this place nor yet how long he continued there. But we are expressly told that this, that this stay was not confined to that locality. Soon afterwards, we find him in Bethbara, which is farther up the stream. An outward appearance and the habits of the messengers responded to the character and to the object of his mission. Neither his dress nor his food was that of the Essenes, and the former at least like that of Elijah, whose mission he was now to fulfill. So they're saying, if anybody thought that John was in a scene, he didn't eat or act like in a scene. He, he, just because he lived out in the wilderness, he spent his time 
baptizing people in the wilderness. Um, <clears throat> he, he ate what was available to him. And frankly, since his daddy was a priest, I'm sure people brought him priestly offerings. And people fed him. People gave him, you know, I don't say charity. Cause it's not really charity. It's what's owed to him for his work. You know, he's out there mikvahing him, and he's probably getting, he's probably collecting payment for it because he's doing a priestly cleansing that these people need done to him to fulfill all righteousness, which is exactly what Yeshua said. I come to you to fulfill all righteousness because that's your job. He didn't mean there's some weird thing that's just between him. He meant literally that to enter into the sacred area around Jerusalem, I must be cleansed because... That's the way that I'm going to fulfill the righteousness, at least that which has been espoused by the Pharisees. All right. This was evidence alike by what he preached and by the new symbolic rite from which he derived the name Baptist. The grand burden of his message was the announcement of the approach of the kingdom of heaven and the needed preparation of his hearers for that kingdom. The latter he sought positively by admonition and, and negatively by warnings, while he directed all to the coming one in whom the kingdom would become, so to speak, individualized. So this is what a prophet does. He tells you what the result's going to be if you don't do what you're told, and he tells you what the results will be if you do do what you're told. And that's it. It's not knowing the future. It's understanding what God's will is, and God's will is that you obey him. Thus, from the first, it was the good news of the kingdom to which all of John's preaching was but subsidiary. Concerning the kingdom of heaven was the great message of John and the great work of Christ himself. We may here say that the whole of the Old Testament sublimated and the whole New Testament realized the idea of it did not lie hidden in the old to be opened up in the New Testament, as did the mystery of its realization. But this role of heaven in the kingdom of Jehovah the very substance of the Old Testament, the object of the calling and the mission of Israel, the meaning of all its ordinances, whether its services were civil or religious, and the underlying idea of all its institutions. It explained alike the history of the people, the dealings of Elohim with them, and the prospects opened up by the prophets. Without it, the Old Testament could not be understood. To give, It gave perpetuity to its teachings and dignity to its representations. This constituted alike the real contrast between Israel and the nations of antiquity and Israel's real title of distinction. Thus, the whole Old Testament was the preparatory presentation of the role of heaven and of the kingship of the Lord. Okay. I mean, that's a big statement, but let's just consider what's actually in the Bible. Okay. People leave Egypt. Yehovah makes himself known through Moses. He says, look, I made a promise to one of your ancestors that I was going to, when he promised to Abraham, I was going to give this land to his descendants. Now, some of y'all are, y'all are his descendants, right? But then I had something more. I took a man named Jacob, and I gave him a new name, and I made him a new man. I turned him from Jacob into Israel, right? So, Israel had 12 sons. You people descend from those 12 sons. I want you to go and to serve me in this land that I have set up as my own land. I want you to go there. I want you to take it over. I want you to administrate it on my behalf in the manner in which I tell you to do it. All right. I want you to be kings and priests in that land. Okay? Firstborn of each of your families is to be the priest of the family. I want that firstborn male to be the priest of the family. Sorry, ladies. Firstborn male to be the priest of the family. Then the golden calf happens. Then it changed. He's like, okay, firstborn male thing ain't gonna work. I want the I want the Levites to be the priesthood. They will have no inheritance in this land we go to. You guys are gonna feed them. You're gonna take care of them. But beyond that, you're still gonna rule as kings. 
but you're not going to rule as priests because obviously I can't trust you to be a priest. So you're going to be kings still. Okay? But they rule as kings. They come into the land. They settle the land. They stop honoring one another by protecting one another because that's kind of a requirement. Because you got the Philistines in the south, you got the Assyrians, you got war, warring tribes all around you who want to destroy you, right? So if Israel will stay strong, hold together, stay strong, support one another, they will last. But they don't. So each time there's a crisis, God sends a judge. The judges are not who you would expect. Ehud is a left-handed man. Being left-handed immediately in the eyes of the ancients makes you seem to be um, evil. If you choose the left-hand path in life, you choo you're choosing a life of um, wickedness and being twisted. I know because I'm left-handed. So, In fact, I know a lot of the men who are in this walk are also left-handed. Perhaps it is our rebellion against the, uh, um, the atrocities we saw within the church that has led us to seek God through his word alone instead of through the dogmas of other people so uh, Ehud was left handed uh, Deborah was a woman uh, one of the judges of Israel was a, um, a mercenary who had been kicked out of the family he was in because his brother had decided that since he was the child from an illegitimate relationship their daddy had that he had no right that he had no right to claim inheritance and that, that they the children of a legitimate relationship were the only ones who had the right of inheritance so they ran him out the house and then later came to him and said look we need you to defeat the enemies of Israel and uh, you know I'm sure that was a humbling experience for the men who said you're the you're the bastard son of a whore. You're not clean like us. And yet, you know, that's who God chose to defeat the enemies of Israel. You know, he, that's, that's how, I mean, that's, that's how it works. He chooses the weirdos. He chooses the ones that don't fit the mold to go and demonstrate his power. Because it's all about him and his glory. It's all about him and his authority. It's all about him and his power. It's not about you. When they were in the wilderness, he said, look, I'm bringing you into here because I want you to clean this land up. Not because you are great, but because they are so evil. He's like, I'm not bringing you there because you're awesome. I'm bringing you there because they're so terrible. And I, I got to have somebody clean this place up. You're my cleaning crew. Go clean it up. I mean, that's it. You're my janitors. Israel is janitors. Kings and priests, but they're janitors. They were meant to serve the world, not to own it and possess. I mean, that's like you talk about people saying, Oh, well, Christ is going to come back. We're going to rule and reign. You know what ruling and reigning means? It means you take responsibility for those who are under your authority. It don't mean you control them. It means if they make a mistake, you pay for it. That's liability. You have liability insurance on your car because you can't afford to pay for it if you get in an accident. You don't have that kind of money. Insurance companies got that kind of money. Because let me tell you, when you get sued for a half a million dollars, you ain't got a half a million dollars. The vast majority of the people in this country do not have half a million dollars to work with. But they can cause that much damage to car wreck like that. They're rare, but you can't deal with it if it hits. That insurance company accepts liability for you. It rules your behavior. The government decides if you can be licensed because they are accepting a role in the responsibility for your behavior. And as long as you have behaved in exactly the way in which the government has said you must, then that insurance company must pay for you. Because that's the deal. So, if the king comes and says, look y'all, I want you to do this, this, and this, and that. And if you do exactly what he says and something bad happens, it ain't your fault, it's the king's fault. Okay? That's ruling and reigning. It's accepting responsibility for the actions of the people who depend on you to lift them up. You are, you are, you, the king is the one at the bottom raising everybody else up to God. The king is the one at the bottom who lifts everyone else up. What did Christ say? He said, if you want to be, he said, if you, the greatest servant, the great, the king, the, the greatest servant is the one who serves the most. Okay. If you want to be great, then you have to serve. 
And you don't serve yourself. You serve those around you. You serve God. You do what he wanted. You raise those people up so they can do what he wants them to do. You are a support structure for other people so that they can be what God wants them to be. It ain't about you. It's about him. It's about him creating the world he wants. And he's not going to force it. He's going to do it the right way, the slow way, because he is a gardener and he is growing the world he wants. He's growing the people he wants. I'm not what he wants, but I'm getting there. You're not what he wants, but I hope you're getting there. And every day you're a little closer to him than you were before. And as long as you keep walking on this path, it says your path will be beset by trials and tribulations. Lord, you know what a trials and tribulations are? You know what the word tribulation means? It means a narrowing path. It means the longer you walk with God, the less able you will be to move to the left or to the right because the road is going to get so narrow that you're going to be stuck walking a fine line and then you'll be where he wants you. Perfectly fit into the narrow way. Then you'll be who you're supposed to be. Trials and tribulations are not there to beat you down. They might be there to beat the you out of you. But they're there to show you. Like here, here come here, here take for instance, Satan comes to Yeshua in the wilderness, right? He offers him three things. He offers him the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what he offered him. He says, hey, how you doing? You, I bet you're pretty hungry. You've been out here starving for a long time. Why don't you tell them rocks to become bread? He says, a man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word from the mouth of God. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Good one. He said, let me take you up on that. Let me take you up here and let me show you. Let me let me put you up on the top of the uh, top of the temple. Look at all this. Look at how glorious. Yeah, look, 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 at the, look at the glory here. This, 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 all, this could all be yours. I mean, it, it's right here. Wait, just take it. He refused the lust of the eyes when it was offered to him. He refused what he saw. Because he knew God had a greater plan. He said, just throw yourself off the top, man. Angels will catch you. It says so in the scripture. Angels will catch you. I'm not, not going to tempt God. If God throws me off, I'm, I'm hoping on them angels. But I'm not going to jump off. You know? And then lastly, he took him on a, on a high mountain. He said, look, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. I will give you power and authority. I will give you the power to control every living being on the planet. That's the pride of life. He said, I'm going to get you so full of yourself that you will have this whole planet serving you. And he said, no, that's not how God does it. I'm here to serve the world. The world's not here to serve me. I'm here to serve it. That's your job. You're a slave. You're a slave to the world's biggest slave. Put some humble in your mouth when you talk to people. Get down on your knees and on your face. You listen to what other people have to say. Don't tell them who they're supposed to be. Listen to who they are. Help them understand who they are. Then maybe they can change. Folks spend their whole lives lying to themselves about who they are. Because it's pretty hard to deal with. Because let me tell you. Go on YouTube and look up modern psychological experiments involving the autonomic nervous system that is uh, the part of your brain that you are not consciously aware of and you will find out through people with split brain look up the people who have split brain um, where they actually cut the brain in half to stop epileptic seizures people who have had that done to them where they literally have two brains that are two it's like having two different people in your head because the two halves of their brain don't directly communicate anymore and the two different halves of the brain have their own thoughts and they, they, they deal with the world in their own ways but what people have learned through the experiments is that the part of your brain that you that is not consciously you is continuously influencing the one that is consciously you. The part of you that's you is right here. You've got a little section of brain right up here that you are operating out of. The conscious you is right here. If this when they when they do a, a transorbital lobotomy and they cut all that up, people weren't, they just turned into zombies. Their bodies still work. 
Their lungs still pump. Their hearts still pump. Some of them could even move around. But they weren't living intelligent people anymore. A lot of them turned into zombies. Some of them, they got helped because they were vicious and they were monsters. And the only way to stop them from doing that was just to disconnect the connections. Okay, but God says, you take my word and you put it as frontlets between your eyes. You'll see Jews wrap the tefillin and they'll put a little cube up here with a little bit of God's word in it right on this part of their head. Why? They don't know why. They do it because it's tradition. I'll tell you why. Because this is where you are. So you take the word of God and put it right there where you are. And you will be able to drive this fleshy body and turn it into a temple of God. The temple of the living God. However, if you refuse, then you will become a temple of the flesh and a slave to it. And you will believe that might makes right. And you will believe that he who has the gold makes all the rules. And all you will care about is where the food's coming from you putting in your mouth. All right. It is said to have taken up it is said to have taken up the yoke of the kingdom of God at Mount Sinai. I'm going to read the previous sentence because that is actually what I was just talking about. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. The kingdom of God and the Targum on Micah 4.7, the kingdom of Yehovah, are the same thing. In fact, the word heaven was very often used instead of God. Uh, so as to avoid the unduly familiarity with the ear with the sacred name. It was forbidden by the rabbis to say, you cannot say Yehovah in public. They won't let you do it today. If you want to know what God's name is, go say Yehovah to a rabbi. If he turns around and walks off from you, or if he slaps you, you got it. That's the name. You know, Congratulations, you did it. Um, but it's forbidden to be said in public because the Greeks forbade it first. Then the Pharisees said, well, we won't say it in public. We don't want anybody to get murdered for saying God's name, and then it became a part of the rabbinical law that you just don't say God's name in public. They say Adonai, which you do actually see him referred to as Adonai by Moses uh, like twice, just a couple times. But, but God has stated his mention should be Yehovah. yod heh vav -Hey. you know, if you want to say it other ways, I think it's ridiculous because you should let people who speak Hebrew teach how to speak Hebrew. You shouldn't make up your own Hebrew words. Uh, but whatever. Strong accordance. Yehovah, Jehovah. Everybody, that's what his name is, okay? When you four Hebrew letters, is three Hebrew syllables. There's not, it's not two Hebrew, it's not a Yahweh, Yahoo, none of that. It's just, it's going, it's four letters, it's three syllables. That's the standing rule in Hebrew. Okay. So, the, the consciousness of its contrast to the earth or to the world was distinctly expressed in rabbinical writings. He's going to quote from the Talmud now. The kingdom of God, or God, must, however, be distinguished from that, from such terms as the kingdom of the Messiah, the future age of the world of the Messiah, or the days of the Messiah, or the age to come. Because all these are mentioned in different writings, right? It's like the age to come. Uh, okay. Both this and the previous expression of the end of days or the end of the extremity of days. Uh, this is the most important since the kingdom of heaven has so often been uh, confounded with the period of its triumphant manifestation in the days or in the kingdom of the Messiah between the advent of the final manifestation of the kingdom. Uh, Jewish expectancy placed a temporary uh, obscuration of the Messiah not his first appearance, but his triumphant manifestation, was to be receded by the so-called sorrows of the Messiah or the tribulation of the latter days. So they refer, to, even in their own rabbinical writings, they said the Messiah would go through uh, tribulation, he would go through sorrows. You know, Obviously, Yeshua went through some sorrows there at the end. You know. And you got to understand, if you look at the Old Testament, there's not the, there's the only a Messiah. There's nonsense. There's no Messiah in the Old Testament. But it became a part of Jewish thought, okay? Everybody loves superheroes. Everybody won't get rescued. Nobody wants to do the work. Everyone wants someone else to come and save them because they don't want to do what is required to be saved 
which is to obey God. Okay? So it becomes such a part of Jewish life. It's just saying, look, I forgot, I forgot to tell you about the judges. So the judges are ruling Israel, right? Well, eventually, they're not satisfied with the judges. The judges can't keep rescuing Israel because Israel won't help itself. So the people in the southern kingdom are like, we're getting attacked by the Philistines. The people in the north won't help us. So they say, Samuel, you're God's judge right now. You're the prophet of God. You're God's judge. You're the high priest. Or sorry, Elias was the high priest. And then Samuel. Um, we want a king. Anoint us a king. And he's like, that's, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. We don't do that. We're Israel. We don't do that. And they're like, give us a king so that we can have someone to organize us and fight for us because we're getting murdered by the Philistines down here and the people in the north won't help. You know, they're like, we're, not, we're getting tired of waiting on God to come and save us because he ain't come. We're dying down here. So he says, that's ridiculous. Are you stupid? If you get a king, a king's going to take the best of your daughters, the best of your sons, the best of your fields, the best of your crops, the best of your land, the best of your horses. He's going to rob you blind and he's going to have every right to do it because you let him be king. It's like, that is not how Israel works. And they said, give us a king. So he goes, talking to God, he's like, oh, I don't know what's going on, God. I'm so sorry. These people are saying this crazy nonsense about a king. And God's like, it's cool, Sam. It's cool. They don't hate you, Sammy. They hate me. Give them what they want. Because if there's one thing I can tell you about God, he keeps giving Israel what it wants. He is the kindest. And at the same time, most backhanded disciplinarian. When I say backhanded, I mean, he ain't hitting you from the front. He just gives you enough rope and lets you hang yourself. So, they elect their own king. Who do they choose? They chose the tallest man in all of Israel. He was head and shoulders taller than every other man in Israel. He was the biggest, baddest man with a plan. And his name was Saul. Samuel agreed. He anointed Saul king. Saul did fight the Philistines. Saul put together a 500-man army. Saul did travel around. He got support from rich people who had good uh, money sources, and he put together a small army. He was a very modest king by all you know, estimations of the word. <clears throat> but then God said, I want David to be king. I want, I want to make this seventh son be king, or eighth, depending on which um, genealogy you look in. I want him to be king. So, while another man is king, who has, God made Saul, God's like, oh, okay, Saul, I'll tell you what, you kill all the Amalekites, you do exactly as I say, wipe them out, don't take anything, don't take no prizes, don't, don't, don't pay your men nothing from the conquest, just, if you'll do that, you can keep being king. So, of course, he didn't do that, he went, took the king and queen hostage, uh, because he knew if he could take them hostage, he would have bargaining and leverage power and political things to happen to come. And he brought back spoil of war of animals, gold, silver, all that stuff he was supposed to burn and leave behind. And basically Samuel's like, why do I hear animals when you're returning? Why do I hear the lowing of cattle? Why do I hear what is obviously proof that you disobeyed what God told you to do? And, and Sam's like, well, I got to pay my man, you know, I, I mean, I got to think about, you know, I'm a king, I got, I, I these guys don't work for free, you know. And Sam was like, okay, that's fine. You're done. You're done. You're not king anymore. God's going to find somebody else. And God did. He chose David. David was an expansionist. He expanded the kingdom. He created big taxes. He then anointed Solomon to be king. Solomon then lost the kingdom of Israel by his terrible ways. Though he wrote much wisdom Ecclesiastes, many Proverbs. These are, the, these are the writings of Solomon. Song of Solomon. These are the writings of Solomon. He was a very smart guy. And he knew how to deal with people. But he didn't know how to deal with God. Because God's real simple and easy to deal with. And he says, just do what I want. And I'll take care of all the other details. Solomon's like, listen, let me teach you how to take care of all the other details. And God doesn't have to. You can do it. <clears throat> so Solomon 
loses the kingdom. He gets torn in half, right? And this begins the long civil war between the northern and southern kingdoms until the Assyrians eventually wipe out the northern kingdom and then Babylon wipes out the southern kingdom and then there is no more Israel. And, and there hasn't been since until just the 1950s. You know, it, it really hasn't existed until just this, the 1950s when the nation was born overnight. <clears throat> Still not sure exactly what he's doing over there, by the way. But I tell you what, if you want to see where miracles happen, well, they happen over there. There was a rabbi recently said not one person will die with the coronavirus. Like a week and a half ago, they had 15 people dead of the coronavirus in Israel. Sorry, rabbi, you were wrong. Which happens to many people who think they know what God's doing. Instead of just waiting on him to do what he's going to do. It's, it's, it's easy to know what God's going to do. If you disobey him, he'll punish you. If you obey him, he'll take care of you. Simple system. He's a father. If you do what daddy wants, daddy likes it. Daddy likes rewarding you for doing what you're supposed to do. If you walk contrary to daddy and disobey daddy, daddy spank. Daddy will correct. And eventually daddy going to kick out if you keep doing it. And that's exactly what he does. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, concerning the Messiah and the, 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 the coming of, the, of his uh, tribulation of his latter days. A review of many passages on the subject shows that in the Jewish mind, the expression kingdom of heaven referred not so much to any particular period, but into the general rule of God. And I agree with this completely. The kingdom of God is at hand, and it will exist if you obey his rules. That's the kingdom of God. What does a king do? He establishes a kingdom, a king's dome. Here's a king's dome. This is what a king's dome is. It's, it's what your brain's in. It's in a king's dome. Okay? That's a king dome. So everything under the dome belongs to the king. Right? Well, the only way you can establish that is by the king has to set rules and regulations for people to abide by. That's how you make a kingdom. You want the kingdom of God to come? Read what he said do and do it. Bam! Kingdom of God is now here. That was easy. Wish I had one of those buttons I could push. He's not... He's not this is kindergarten. Like Christ said, let the young come to me. Because when you learn it, you got to learn, you got to start learning from when you're young. You don't teach calculus to a five-year-old. You teach them one plus one is two, two plus two is four, four plus four is eight. You work your way up from the from there. God makes this stuff simple. He teaches simple stuff. You want to learn the crazy, amazing stuff? Start with the simple stuff. God. The taking upon oneself of the yoke of the kingdom or of his commandments, exactly, the former preceding and conditioning of the latter. Accordingly, the Mishnah states and gives us the reason why in the collection of scriptures, which forms the prayer called the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad, Baruch Shem Kavod, Malkuto, Le'alom Hero Israel. Yehovah is our Elohim, and Yehovah is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And will you please love your neighbor as you love yourself? That's it. The two the two laws upon which all hangs. Put God first and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Everything else is just a discussion of that. <clears throat> All right. And Deuteronomy has an admonition. Deuteronomy eleven thirteen. Because a man takes upon himself first the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, and afterwards that of the commandments. And in this sense, the repetition of the Shema as the personal acknowledgement of the rule of Yehovah is itself often designated as taking upon oneself the kingdom of heaven. Similarly, the putting on of the phylacteries and the washing of the hands are also described as taking upon oneself the yoke of the kingdom. To give the instances, Israel is said to have taken up the yoke of the kingdom of God at Mount Sinai. And what happened at Mount Sinai? Well, that's where Moses got the Ten Commandments. If you obey the rules of a king, then you have established his kingdom. That's it. That is the definition of the words. 
and it is said to have taken up this yoke at Sinai. The children of Jacob at their last interview with their father and Isaiah on his call to the prophetic office were it is also noted that it must be done willingly and gladly. On the other hand, the sons of Eli, or Eli and the sons of Ahab are said to have cast off the kingdom of heaven. And clearly, because the sons of Ahab, that's Jezebel's children, <clears throat> worshipped Baal. Obviously, they threw off the kingdom of the Elohim of Israel because they embraced the kingdom of the Elohim of Tyre. The Baal of Tyre is who their mama taught them to worship. When it comes to Eli's sons, Eli's sons did not follow the requirement to properly remove the fat from meat before they'd eat it. They like, they like a, look, they like a nice juicy steak. You know what I'm saying? They like a nice juicy steak, nice, nice trim piece of fat on it. Mm, it's good stuff. They like it nice and savory. They were barbecuing and they wanted their stuff. Like, I want my, I want my rib, I want my prime rib, medium rare. You know, I want it. I want it to cut. I like. I like it nice and marble. I like a marble cut. Everyone prior to them had boiled the meat first to remove all of the fat from it. Then they would cook it. That meat was twice cooked before they were able to eat it. And I guarantee you, it tasted bleh, just as bleh as it could be, because it wasn't about them having an awesome steak. It was about them obeying what God told them to do, which, by the way, would protect their health because the fat is where. The toxins and stuff are filtered in your body. So when you eat an animal's fat, you eat all the toxins that he has that the animal has filtered out of itself. Alright. Alright. Behold, the Lord has come. While thus the acknowledgement of the rule of God, both in profession and practice, was considered to constitute the kingdom of God. I'll read that again. While thus the acknowledgement of the rule of God, God's in charge, both in profession and what you say and practice what you do with your hands that is the evidence of the kingdom of God and who said that you want to know my faith see what I do you want to know why I do what I do it's because of my faith that's New Testament but it's not New Testament it's Old Testament when you read the words of Jude when you read the words of these, these men are not some, teaching you some weird crazy new religion of the New Testament they're, the Christian religion. No, they're teaching you Judaism that was pretty commonly taught at the time. In fact, the yeah, let's see here. Thus, in the Targum of uh, Isaiah 4 9, 4 9, those are explanations, but Targums are explanations by the rabbis who taught them. The words, Behold your God, are paraphrased. The kingdom of your God is revealed, similarly. We read, when the time approaches that the kingdom of, of heaven will shall be made manifest, then shall be fulfilled that, quote, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. So, if Israel will do what God said, then God will be the king over all of the earth. Israel's job is to, do, okay, high priest, on Yom Kippur, goes into the most holy place. He anoints the Ark of the Covenant. He apologizes to God for all of Israel and says, well, first he apologizes for himself. He's like, I'm sorry for all the crap I've done. I know I've done something wrong. I'm so sorry. Apologizes for Israel. We have all done wrong. I'm so sorry. Please continue to work with us. This is propitiation. This is where it says, only by the blood of Christ am I saved. What that means is, when the blood of Christ grows onto you, God is willing to continue to work with you. He's like, look, if you're willing to let Christ guide you, I'll work with you. I'll get you where I need you to be. I'll honor you. I'll love you. I'll care for you. And I'll work with you. Every year, the high priest had to go and make that request. And every year, at least while they had an ark, the request was made at Yom Kippur. Okay, so... Then the priesthood ministers to, well, then the priest ministered to high priest, right? Because they had to help him deal with that terrible thing he has to do. So it's very dangerous to go into the presence of God. Because there were legends of the high priest being killed in the Holy of Holies because God did not accept what they did. 
or they were not true and honest or pure or whatever, whatever reason. You know. So the priesthood would minister to the high priest. Then the high priest would minister to the priesthood. The priesthood would minister to the Levites. The Levites would minister to the priesthood. The Levites would minister to all of Israel. Israel would minister to the Levites. Israel ministers to the 70 nations. And the 70 nations begin to minister to Israel. Thus, the kingdom of God is upon the earth. If the Jews will do what they're supposed to, then naturally, God's word would spread and grow and become fruitful. This is exactly why Gamaliel, when, said, when he said to him, why are you going to let these guys do what they're going to do? Gamaliel's like, look, if God is in what is happening, then it's going to prosper. And if he's not, it's going to fail. You don't need me to smash these people or to lift them. And God does all that on his own. I and mean, this, this is one of the head teachers, head rabbinical teachers of the day. This is probably the man with whom trained the Apostle Paul, probably who taught the Apostle Paul, Gamaliel, right? He was a head, I think he was one of the heads of the Sanhedrin. Um, but I'd have to go look, after Hillel, but I'd have to look it up. Um, point being, this is just basic stuff. This is, this is the life of obedience. This is the life of, just let God tell you what to do. He won't lead you wrong. He'll give you the right, read his word. It, we got plenty of stories and we got plenty of direct, straight up laws to tell us how we need to behave and what we're supposed to do. And if you can't find the law in here, it all goes back to two things. Well, does it put God first? Okay, you're good. Well, is it you showing love to your neighbor? Okay, it's good. Go for it, you know. Is it the lust of the eye? That's bad. Is it the lust of the flesh? That's bad. Is it the pride of life? But that's bad. It's a simple system. All right. On the other hand, the unbelief of Israel would appear in that they would reject these three things. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the house of David, and the building of the temple, according to the prediction of Hosea 3, 5. It follows that after the period of unbelief, the messianic deliverances and the blessings of, excuse me, Athid Labho, or the future age, were expected. But a final completion of all still remained for the Olam Abba, or the world to come. Olam, forever, Abba. Um, well, wouldn't that be father? Maybe that means father's future. And that there is a distinction between the time of the Messiah and this world to come is frequently indicated in rabbinical writings. I'm probably just, I probably just don't know that a boss spelled a different way there. Um, we've already seen this. this the, Israel's already done its rejection. Israel, Hanukkah is the celebration of Israel's rejection. I'm waiting for the hush to fall over the crowd. Let's see, there's, there's one person watching though. I, I guess I'll just I'll have, I will enlighten you concerning Hanukkah okay after I turn down that phone call um, concerning Hanukkah the Maccabean revolt right Levites rose up overthrew their Jewish or sorry well I mean they were I mean yes they really did they overthrew Jewish and Greek um, people who were willing to integrate with the Greek culture right so they were zealots and they had a civil war, basically killed off the Jews that didn't want to do things Jewish, and they killed off a lot of the Greeks that were trying to run the country, and eventually the Greeks decided they just let them rule themselves and, you know, charge them taxes or whatever. So the Hasmoneans become quote-unquote kings, thus rejecting the line of David. We already saw that. That already happened. Then they um, took over the uh, priestly office, and then the priestly office became an office for purchase, which meant that th that made the temple irrelevant because, I mean, the high priest is supposed to be the cleanest and the best because he's got to go face to face with God and make apologies for people. And you need to do, you need to be on the right, you need to be on your best foot forward when you're making apologies. And, uh, you know, obviously that's, that wasn't it. So we've already seen the fulfillment of this, uh, this Hosea prophecy. <clears throat> As we pass from the Jewish ideas of the time to the teaching of the New Testament, we feel that 
while there was a complete change of spirit, the form in which the idea of the notion that it, the expression refers to the church, whether visible according to the Roman Catholic view or invisible according to the certain Protestant writers, the kingdom of God or the kingly rule of God is an objective fact. The visible church can only be the subjective attempt at its outward realization, of which the invisible church is the true counterpart. When Christ says in John 3.3 3, that except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God, he teaches an opposition to the rabbinic representation of how the kingdom of God was taken up. Then a man cannot even comprehend that glorious idea of the reign of God and of the becoming of a conscious, by conscious self-surrender, one of his subjects, except he first be born from above. Similarly, the, the meaning of Christ's further teaching on this subject seems to be that, except that a man be born of water, which is the profession, which, well, it's a mikvah, and of the spirit, which is the words from God's mouth, right? He cannot really enter into fellowship with the kingdom. Okay, well, that's pretty obvious. If you don't get yourself clean, and you don't obey God's words, then you have no part in his kingdom. You will always be a poor wretch who's wandering around living off the charity of everybody else because the people whom God is kind to and whom he feeds have enough to feed you too. And they know that they have to because where the dead are, vultures gather. Do you want to be a vulture or do you want to be dead to your flesh? We are supposed to be crucified daily. We are supposed to be dead flesh that walks, right? We are dead to our flesh because we live by spirit now. So dead flesh draws vultures and vultures will come to pick at the flesh. And the thing about being crucified is that you can't fight back against it. You have to let the vultures eat. Oh, and that's such a pain. Ooh, that just goes contrary to good old American values. America. Because the idea that God would allow you to be picked, not picked clean, because, you, because you've been given water that never ends. You've been given the manna from heaven. The food never stops coming. I mean, the day, the day that you can get worried is the day that God stops taking care of you. If you've seen the day that God stops taking care of you, then curse God and die. That's what Job's wife said to him. She's like, look, if you really think, if, if this ain't proof enough that he has turned his back on you, then ain't you ain't never going to get proof. And Job's like, nope. He still gave me my life. He still, he still lets me live. He still let me live. Even though I am in pain, even though I am suffering, even though I have lost everything that I had, he still gives me life. He still gives me breath. He still gives me Ruach. I can't curse him. I can't do it. So, again, nothing new under the sun. The rabbis teach a lot of the same things that you'll learn in the church, or really not in the church. Same things you'll learn if you read the New Testament, because most of those men were taught by rabbis. They came through the synagogue school, the school system of the synagogue, and they learned there. That's where Yeshua went and taught. That's where he healed the man. It was in the synagogue. He healed him on the Sabbath day, and there was a big uproar about it. And then he pointed out from the law that there shouldn't be an uproar because the law says, you know, I can heal. The law says you you unbind you to unbind an you would take the yoke off of an ox if you found one on him on the Sabbath. But you let a man stay yoked up in pain and suffering? That's just crazy. And that's really what I like about him is the way he talks to him. He's just like, some of the stuff you say, spot on. Good show. Some of the stuff you say, just crazy. You spent so much time reasoning that you forgot what you was really supposed to be doing is caring. You forgot you were supposed to be reasoning with your heart. Not fully with your intellect. Because put God first. Love your neighbor. How are you going to love them? You're going you're gonna to have to put some of this into it. It's going to take some of this to get to get love into somebody else. I'm going to tell you what, this guy right here suffers. 
when you wear your heart on your sleeve, you're going to suffer. You're going to bleed. It's going to hurt. Until one day, you realize that your heart is bleeding 24 hours a day. It, that is what it does. Your heart squeezes blood through it all day long. Your bleeding heart is bleeding all the time. It is in constant pain. And that is okay. Because it's made for it. And as we pass from the Jewish ideas uh, let's see here. Similarly, the meaning of Christ's further teachings on this subject seem to be that except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot really enter the kingdom. In fact, an analysis of 119 passages in the New Testament where the expression kingdom occurs shows that it means truly the rule of God which was manifest in and through Christ, is apparent in the church, gradually develops among hindrances, and is a triumphant at the second coming of Christ, which is the end, and finally perfected, finally perfected in the world to come. Thus viewed, the announcement of John and the near advent of this kingdom had deepest meaning, although as so often is the case of propheticism, the stages of the intervene that intervene between the advent of the Christ and the triumph of the kingdom seem to have been hidden from the preacher. He came to call Israel to submit to the reign of God, about, about to be manifest in Christ. Okay, not submit to Christ, submit to the reign of God manifest in Christ. That is to say, this man Yeshua is a living example of what a man who lives by the word of God alone is. This is what he looks like, okay? That's your example. Follow the example. Learn. Be taught. You've been given an example. Hence, on the one hand, he called them to repentance, which is to teshuvah, which is to turn and return. So turn around and go back to, that's teshuvah. Turn around and go back to God, right? Turn from yourself, return to God. He came to call Israel to submit. Uh, hence, uh, with all that is implied and with all that uh, on the other, pointed them to Christ in the exaltation of his person and in his office. Uh, or rather, the two combined might be summed up to call it a change of mind. Repent, which implies not only a turning from the past, but a turning to Christ in the newness of mind, and thus the symbolic action by which this preaching was accompanied might be designated the baptism of repentance. So, of course, the baptism of repentance would be that you actually agree to stop doing what you want and to start doing what God wants. But to do that, you actually have to learn what he wants, which is why when Paul's writing to Corinth, to the Corinthians, he says, listen, I want to, I so desperately would love to feed y'all meat, but you ain't ready for meat. You're little babies. I got to teach you milk. I, I, you got somebody in this you got somebody in this this congregation who has taken his father's wife that is strictly forbidden in the Torah I have taught you that it is strictly forbidden and yet still you do it and you smile about it and you say well it's okay grace abounds he's like get that man out of the congregation or I'm not going to come back and have nothing to do with you okay because he was working to create a holy Set apart people. Not a grace and mercy filled group of people. God has got plenty of grace and mercy. God has mercy enough for everyone. Okay? You have a duty to put yourself into the conditions he wants you to be in. Your duty is not to go out and murder other people. Your duty is to clean yourself and to keep yourself clean. He likes his women to smell nice. And when you got the stink of death on you, you don't smell nice. It's a very simple system, y'all. All right. The account given by Luke bears on its face that of a, of a summary, not only of the first, but all, but all of John's preachings. The very essence of his hearers at this call to and baptism of repentance was give to the point on these, one, on these words. Did they who, notwithstanding their sins, lived in such security of carelessness and self-righteousness really understand and fear the final consequences of resistance to the coming kingdom? 
If so, theirs must be the repentance not only in profession, but in heart and mind, such as would yield fruit, both good and visible, or else did they imagine that, according to the common notion of the time, the vials of wrath were to be poured out only on the Gentiles. While they, as Abraham's children, were sure of escape, in the words of the Talmud, that the night was only to the nations of the world, but the morning to Israel. So, yes, if Israel did exactly what it was supposed to do, I do believe that the night would be on the rest of the world and the mourning for that world would be upon Israel because Israel should mourn. When the Egyptians lost all their firstborn, there should have been mourning in, in Goshen. There should have been people saying, oh no, I'm so sorry. I tried to tell you. I did everything I could to tell you. You've got to put that blood on that door. And I don't know if you've seen the Ten Commandments movie with Charlton Heston, but they run and put the blood on the door of an Egyptian family. Somebody did that they cared about to spare that Egyptian family the loss of their child, which is, you know, looks great on the movie. I don't know if it's what really happened. I hope so. I really do. I hope they went around and threw blood on all kinds of people's doors to keep them safe. Folks they knew and cared about who had took care of them and been friends with them. Tell you what, I probably would. I don't know. I don't know. It definitely be on my door. I'd be like, look, y'all, I don't know what's going to happen, but he said, put blow on the door. I'll put blow on my door. I'll do it. I'm scared of it. I'm stupid, but I take him at his word. <clears throat> For no principle was more established in the popular conviction than that all of Israel had part in the world to come, and this specifically because of their connection with Abraham. This appears not only in the New Testament, John 8.33, from Philo and Josephus, but also from rabbinical passages. The merits of the fathers is one of the common phrases in the mouth of rabbis. Abraham was represented as sitting at the gate of Gehenna to deliver any Israelite who otherwise might have been consigned to his terrors. Gehenna, Gehenom, the Valley of Hinnom. Yes, we don't want to go to the Valley of Hinnom. That's where the trash is burning where the fires are never quenched and where the worm never dies, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, because that's where the trash is burned, and that is where the babies were murdered to Moloch. So yes, obedience to the God of Abraham will save you from those things, because you're not allowed to go out where the nastiness is, and you're definitely not allowed to murder children and give them to Moloch. Those things are not allowed. Uh, who otherwise might have been consigned to his terrors. In fact, by their descent from Abraham, all the children of Israel were nobles, infinitely higher than any proselyte. Of course, yes. What exclaims the Talmud shall be, shall the born Israelite stand upon the earth and the proselyte be in heaven? Question mark. In fact, the ships on the sea were preserved through the merit of Abraham. The rain descended on the account of it. For his sake alone had Moses been allowed to ascend into heaven and to receive the law. For his sake, the sin of the golden calf had been forgiven. His righteousness had been many occasions been in the support of Israel's cause. Daniel had been heard for the sake of Abraham. Nay, his merit availed even for the wicked in its extravagance. The Midrash thus uh, apost apostrophes Abraham, quote, If thy children were even morally dead bodies without blood vessels or bones, thy merit would avail for them. And that's a common rabbinical thing where you say, well, if there's somebody who's awesome and did good, then we can pray to them and have them uh, support us, which is exactly what people do with Christ all the time. They say, here's this great, you know, the great rabbi who taught and led and who suffered and died for me, and I want to pray because his, his good works will cover me. That's a rabbinical teaching. It's not really biblical teaching, but it is rabbinical teaching. And uh, hey, if it works, it works. I don't got some problem with it. But if such had been the inner thoughts of his hearers, John warned them that God was able of these stones that strewn the riverbank to raise up children unto Abraham, or reverting to his former illustration of fruit meets for repentance, that the proclamation of the kingdom was at the time the laying of the axe to the root of every tree that bore not fruit. He's like, look, you quit with all this, the merit of others, you better start bearing fruit. You better, or God's going to come with his winnowing fork. 
and chop down every tree that does not bear fruit. Because he's had enough of this saying, well, I'm going to do what I want, but I'm going to pray to these, I'm going to pray to this rabbi, and they're going to they do it for me. No. Israel's job is kings and priests. And he broke it, he had to break it up into priests and kings. Then he had to break it up into, into one king and slaves. But when that king was removed, y'all kings again. Okay? Caesar might be your Caesar might be your emperor, but you are kings again. Kings serve under the emperor. Um, let's see. That of every tree that bore not fruit, then making implication of it in answer to the specific inquiry of various classes. The preacher gave them such practical advice as applied to the well-known sins of their past, yet in this also not going beyond the merely negative or preparatory element of repentance. The positive or all-important aspect of it was to be represented in the Christ. It was only natural that the hearers wondered whether John himself was the Christ, since he has thus urged repentance. For this was so closely connected in their inner thoughts to the advent of the Messiah that it was said, if Israel repented but one day, the son of David would immediately come. But here John pointed them to the difference between himself and his work, and the person of the mission of Christ in the deepest reverence. He declared himself not worthy to do him service as a slave or as a disciple. You know, I think it's interesting, you know, the rabbis will say, if uh, if Israel would repent together for one day, the Messiah would immediately come, and the world would be brought to the, to the next stage, right? Um, we can't get people to stay inside with the coronavirus out there killing people. And still people go out and do what they want to do, you know. And you want people to do what God tells them to do? And, you know, and he ain't running around making people cough up blood. So, you know, I mean, he does He does do it. I mean, I do. I would say he was definitely what's behind it all, but, you know. Even the fleshy man knows he should fear death and a, and a terrible death at the hands of a killer virus. But, uh, they don't. Some don't. His baptism would not be a preparatory repentance and with water, but the divine baptism in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, we know what God is. He's an all-consuming fire, right? Burns away all the crap and keeps the good, pure things. And the Spirit who sanctified and the divine light which purified and so effectively qualified for the kingdom. And there was still another contrast. John's was but preparing work. The Christ that of the final decision, after it came the harvest. His was the harvest, and his was the garner. His also the fan, with which he would sift the wheat from the straw and the chaff. The one to be garnered, and other burned with fire, unexhausted, inextinguishable. Thus early in the history of the kingdom of God was it indicated that alike that which would prove useless as straw and good corn were in... Corn? Well, let's say good wheat were inseparably connected in God's harvest field till the reaping time. They both belonged to him and that the final separation would only come at the last days by his own hand. So you let the wheat and the chaff grow together because when they're prepared, you'll be able to see which one's which. One's which and then you pull out the chaff first, get rid of it. What John preached, that he also symbolized by the right which, though not in itself, yet in its implication, was wholly new. Hitherto the law had it that those who had contracted Levitical defilement were to immerse before offering sacrifice. You must be clean. And again, to be prescribed to such Gentiles as to become proselytes of righteousness or proselytes of the covenant. The Ger Hazik Hazik, the Ger Hazadik, or the Ger Habarith. In other words, the um, covenant is. Brit, right? Of the Chabarit, the Brit. The Ger is the outsider. Ha is the, and Brit is the circumcision of Brit, or the uh, covenant, keeping of the covenant. The Ger Chazadik is a is a Ger who is a uh, righteous man, a Ger who is righteous, a proselyte unto righteousness. We're to be admitted to full participation in the privileges of Israel by the threefold rites of circumcision, baptism, and sacrifice. Uh, the immersion being, as it were, the acknowledgement of the symbolic removal of moral defilement, corresponding to that of a Levitical cleanliness, but never before had it been proposed that Israel should undergo a baptism of repentance, although there were indications of a deeper insight into the meaning of Levitical baptisms. Was it intended that the hearer of John should give this evidence of their repentance, that, like persons defiled, they sought purification, and like strangers, they sought admission among the people who took themselves 
who, who took on themselves the rule of God. Those two ideas would indeed have made it truly a baptism of repentance. But it seems difficult to suppose that the people would have been prepared for such admissions, or at least that they that there should have been no record of the mode in which a change so deeply spiritual was brought about. May it not rather have been as it was when the first covenant was made. Moses was directed to prepare Israel by a symbolic baptism of their persons, as we sprinkle them with blood, and their garments. So the initiation of the new covenant by which the people were to enter the kingdom of God was preceded by another general symbolic baptism of those who would be the true Israel and receive or take on themselves the law from God. In that case, the right would have acquired not only a new significance to be deeply and truly the answer to John's call, in such case also no special explanation would have been needed on the part of the Baptist, nor yet such spiritual insight on that of the people as we can scarcely suppose them to have been possessed at that stage. Lastly, in that case, nothing could have been more suitable nor more solemn than Israel in waiting for the Messiah and the rule of God, preparing as their fathers had done at the foot of Mount Sinai. Okay. That is, that's the chapter. We've, we've now completed one chapter of this book. Oh, I'm telling you, we have done great. Only, what, two hours of reading it, cut through one chapter? That was just the intro. That was just a little introduction about John the Baptist. But that book is so packed full of information, so packed full of um, just just information that Jews know, religious Jews know already know all this stuff. They know what was going on in Jerusalem. They they it's all in the Talmud. It's recorded in there. In the Mishnah records the, the oral traditions, the laws. They know all this stuff. It's the Christians who don't because they don't care to, because they just want it. They just want it to be easy. And honestly, it can be very easy. But the life of a slave is not a life of ease. It is a life of service. So if you are, if you wish to be slave to Christ, then you got to serve. If you want to receive the mercy and the grace of God, He gives that anyways. He, he He's already said, he said to He said to Moses on the mount. He said, "I will show mercy upon whomever I will show mercy," because that's His business. He will lift up kings and He'll knock kings down. And he will, he will raise men up and he'll knock them right back down. He will do whatever he wants to do to whoever he wants to do it to because it's his prerogative. He's made a deal with the people that want to covenant with him concerning what he'll do for them. And part of that covenant means he's going to take care of you. He's going to feed you. You get that manna. You get that water. You get the things you need to live, but you live to serve. So that being said, Baruch Abav Hashem. So blessed be God's name, um, Jehovah, and all power and all glory is to Him. And uh, you know, don't let uh, don't let your pride get in the way of uh, uh, coming to understand that your your life really is a life of just being humble. It's humble, humble like Moses' time, and instead of uh, anger or uh, you know misgivings or what or unforgiveness or whatever else you know people, all those things just are an outshoot of pride. That's what it really is. It's an outshoot. It's, it, it's when we think that we really are in control, that's when we start having problems because we're really not. God's in control. If you're having a problem, ask him to help. Wait on him. Give him time to help. He'll fix it. You know, you didn't get in trouble overnight. Well, I mean, some of us do. You know, give, give him time. If he fails you, well, obviously he ain't for you. You know, he, he ain't failed me. So I appreciate him. I appreciate you. Be blessed, and I uh, hope everyone's having a good pandemic quarantine. Oh, speaking of which, by the way, one day when we're looking back, you know, people are like, oh, the end of the world's coming. I had some guys like, Christ's going to be here within three years. Cause this. I'm like, man, don't you think people were saying that during that Spanish flu? Don't you think people were saying that when Rome burned? Don't you think people were saying that when London burned? We're having something that's never happened before. We live in an age when people are actually aware of what causes the problem. And we can actually avoid it. We have been told by scientists that it can be avoided. We can keep ourselves safe by being set apart, separated out, set apart, right? By being holy, keeping ourselves clean, keeping ourselves separate. We will be protected from this plague. Now, there might be some folks that end up very poor, but a lot, most people, 90% of the people are already very poor. 
Well, oh, 90% of people in the world are dirt poor, living on two days of, you know, two dollars a day or whatever it is. Uh, the problem is going to be for folks in the Western world who are going to start to experience being poor. Um, and it's going to be rough, but that's okay because it'll just teach you to depend on God again. And if you take the time that's being given to you now and use it in a productive manner, um, glorify him, thank him for the time, and, uh, you know, just take care of things that you should have been taking care of anyways that you've been putting off. When you look back, you'll be like, thank you, God, for all that time you gave me. Thank you for the time that you set me apart. By the way, Passover's right around the corner. Let's get that leaven out of your house. It's spring cleaning time. Clean your house. Spring clean it. You got no excuse. You're there. Clean it. Get the leaven out of your house. Get the dust out of your house. Get the dirt out of your house. Get all the uncleanliness out of your house. Have a spick and span. Has a, you know, that spick and span. It used to be a cleaner call. It's probably still out there. It's called spick and span. My mom used to use it. But uh, get, get your house spick and span clean. You know, do it. Clean it. It's time for it. It's that time of year. God has put you in a unique position to do just that. Be thankful. And be blessed.